We are live. Welcome to Jennifer's Body 2009 movie review and thoughts. So I was originally going to do this in this year's Pride Month, but I was also going to do just Kissing Jessica Stein this year's Pride Month, and that's no longer on Disney+. Plus. So I decided I'm just going to have to do it because, because I did not want this to leave with all the things I've heard about it. I had to, to watch this before... It's, you know, eventually, I'm, I'm not sure, it's not going to be on Disney Plus forever, but yeah, I wanted to make sure. So, I'm going to start by telling you, this was a movie I really loved. It's true. It's on the Wikipedia. And this video, there's not going to be a huge amount of jokes, at least not from, I'm, I might quote someone else's jokes, but I'm not. Uh, and I will definitely get into a number of serious topics. So, uh, behind me, I put Hellraiser and the um, Nightmare on Elm Street films, since those are other great horror movies that star empowered young women fighting supernatural evil. And, uh, yeah, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because of that, it's not as much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will go into the politics. And, let's see. Yeah, so, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers, you can mute and skip ahead and see me lower my index finger. And uh, yeah, as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So let's see the uh, yeah. So content warning and or trigger warning. This features some of the following, and I'm going to be discussing some of the following in relation to this movie: torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting. Murder, xenophobia, body horror, sexual assault and or rape, grief and mourning, and bullying. So, um, while I am an ally, I am not myself part of the LGBTQ community. I wouldn't mind if I were, but I can't claim that I am as such. I'm not trying to tell members of the community what to think or feel. I'm merely sharing my interpretation. I know from experience with my fellow cishet. Some only listen to cishet, not members of the community. And I will also be quoting some members of the community. If members of the community feel that I say something offensive in this video, or any other video of mine, please let me know. I'm completely open to editing that part out, and if it's a case where the whole video is bad, taking it down. And I am a lifelong feminist, but I am a cishet man. As such, I have never lived as a woman, cis or trans. I try to show empathy and listen to the lived experience of women, but I am aware I have blind spots, and as such, I might accidentally say something ignorant. So, if any woman is bothered by something I say in one of these videos, please let me know. Again, opening, open to editing it out, and... If the entire video is really, really hurt by it, taking the video down. So, the movie's rated R, and so is this video. And, um... If you're someone who hates this film, you know, I don't hate you personally. Uh, I'm willing to debate. You know, I'm gonna try to make the case for the movie here. You know... If you want to debate it in the comment section, the only thing I ask is that you keep it respectful, and I'll answer uh, respectfully. If you write something hateful, whether it's directed towards me or other, you know, any any member of a minority, I'm most likely just going to ignore you. So, let's see. Right, um, I'm going to say some negative things in this video about conservatives. I'm not saying that all of the things that I say about conservatives are true of all conservatives. If what I'm describing just isn't you, please try not to take it personally, and rather than, you know, get defensive uh, with, with me or other progressives, try to talk to other members of your community and convince them to not do these things. And... That brings us... So, uh, let's see... Hmm. 
Here we go. Yes. Uh, so I have watched this once. I just got done watching it before I started recording. I'm basing this video on the theatrical cut. I would like to watch the director's cut, but the one on Disney Plus is the theatrical basing on... I've, I've read some about some of the stuff that's in the director's cut and, and the, the running time, and those are just not in this. Oh, right. I actually, yeah, there was something I will very quickly edit. Let's see. Because I thought this was something that was in the, uh, yeah, it's got to be around here. Yeah. Um, the, um, here we go. So, um, there we go. Yeah, uh, something that I thought was in the theatrical, and it's in the director's cut. Um, some, some of the people... I've seen video review of this have used the director's cut and don't always disclose it and thus I yeah um yeah uh, th this is one of those movies where like I have been watching spoiler stuff about this for over 10 years now you know the when when I um, this movie was horribly marketed uh if they had put out a trailer that gave you a proper idea of what the movie was like I would have gone to see this in theaters in 2009 and, you know, done a video on it back then. Um, yeah, ignore the marketing. It was completely misguided. And I'm not, you know, I, I believe I'm putting links in the description box of at least one video, which makes it a link, not several, that talk about how bad the, the marketing was. Um, yeah. And as such, I figured I was never going to watch it, so I've, yeah, I've had this movie thoroughly spoiled, and yet everything worked. Like, um, it, yeah, the, the, the scares, the horror, uh, I despised the people that I was supposed to, and felt really, really empathized with the ones, yeah, where that was the idea. Uh, let's see, so I... Yeah, so, the plot. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm gonna use some of the IMDb one. Nerdy, reserved bookworm, needy, lesnicky, and arrogant, conceited cheerleader Jennifer Check are best friends, though they share little in common. And, uh, yeah, something, something very messed up happens, and, um,. Yeah, it turns into a horror movie. I, I really don't want to give away the the details. It, it's, yeah. So, uh, the IMDb more like this list compares this to The Craft from 96, not the not the remake. Yeah, there's definitely some, some truth to that. Heathers from 1988, 13, Mean Girls, Girl Fight, Girl... Girl Interrupted. Yeah, yeah, there's some Girl Interrupted in this for sure. Uh, Ready or Not, Clueless, Carrie 2013, The Love Witch, But I'm a Cheerleader, and Ginger Snaps. Now, yeah, uh, so I mentioned, yeah, you might have been able to deduce. I did watch The Graph 96, I did watch Girl Interrupted, I have not watched any of those others. Uh, yeah, and on Disney+, Plus, the suggested section brings up Scream Queens, Buffy, the film, Ready or Not, Abe Lincoln, Vampire Heart, well, Abraham Lincoln, yeah. Dark Water, the American one, American horror story, horror story, Buffy the show, and What We Do in the Shadows, the show, not the movie. Um, I forget if they have the. I, th I think they don't have the movie. They only have the show, if I recall. Anyway, um, yeah, the, you know, I, I, um, every so often someone would mention this, and then like, was it? Was it maybe 2019? It, it was. It was uh, in in. Um, it was when the Me Too movement was, you know, yeah, it, it, this got a critical real re-evaluation, uh, you know, because it does basically, it do, it does some of the Me Too stuff before Me Too, um, 
and the the um what's the word um yeah you know so i've i've heard a bunch of people talking about that it was completely misunderstood and I mean, I've basically always been open to the idea that it was a good movie. It just, you know, yeah, some of the stuff you heard about in 2009, like, some of the people who really hate this, not all, but if you, if this movie didn't work for you, like, for a number of the, those people, um, I would say at least half, maybe more, they went into it expecting to hate it based on the marketing based on how many women had a lot of power in shaping the movie based on megan fox and i will i've never really understood that the hatred towards her but i will be talking about it when i get into the the character section so so yeah um you know months ago when i realized this was on disney plus I figured that, you know, it would be a good fit for Pride Month. And, yeah. Doing it now because it is not... I, I did consider if I wanted to maybe record it now and not upload it until Pride. But... At the, at the risk of being cynical i would call it realistic by the time this year's pride month and very likely during there will be some hate crimes and legislation against the the lgbtq community and it would feel really gross for me to upload a video during that that doesn't at all bring that up and yeah now, this was written by Diablo Cody, and apparently she is writing an untitled Madonna biopic, which is in pre-production. Yeah, uh, I can I can see how that. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm interested. Yeah, honestly, you know, Madonna is another young woman, young female celebrity who got a lot of hate and it's like what what has she done that has made you this venomously angry you know um the the take just did a uh, a video talking about the most recent um harry and megan uh I'm, I'm gonna see if i can find it real quick so i can get the title the video is not here or am I just missing? Uh, oh, right. It's I guess it's a little longer ago, a little further down on the recent. So yes, um, yeah, uh, uh, yesterday, yeah, a video by the take called "Why People Are Turning Away from Harry and Meghan Royals," and the, the they went they they go into some of the the just irrational hatred that that Meghan Markle got uh in in general it's a good video but then all the takes videos are, are really really great um now the and they do go into you know some of the reasons regular people might not love Harry and, and Meghan as individuals um so, uh, yeah, most of what Diablo Cody has done, I'm really not familiar with, um, I guess. Yeah, she's she's uh, written several Charlize Theron movies, and that's, like, I, I, has, has Charlize Theron ever done a movie that was just, like, for the paycheck? I feel like she always sees something in the movie that she can do something with something interesting um but but yeah um she did also write juno i haven't watched it um i'm not currently planning on it it i don't think it's on disney plus i'll do a real quick check 
it is on Disney Plus. Why? Oh yeah, I guess because it doesn't show up when I in under suggested, even though it has the same writer. But anyway, um, I don't know. Uh, if someone watching this video really, really wants me to do a video on Juno, I will, at the very least, I am willing to consider it. Um, and I certainly, I, I don't have anything against that movie. I'm just not sure I'm really, that it's really for me, like, um, teen pregnancy. It's an important issue, uh, especially unplanned pregnancy is, um... And, and certainly I've heard some things about it that make a, a positive impression on me. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure it's, it's really for me, but yeah, uh, I hear that the dialogue in this and that, uh, you know, there's a, she has a, a voice uh, for, for dialogue and an ear for dialogue. Um, yeah that I if I were to watch it now a chunk of why is definitely a, a significant part of the reason why would be the the dialogue now um, so Diablo Cody was temporarily a stripper so when this came out a bunch of people who can't tell the difference between a job and a calling struggled to see her humanity in reality her experience with stripping made her especially acutely aware of sexual objectification and she uses that awareness in the movie back then and some still today even a lot of women you know I, I forget exactly who said it but someone pointed out Late 2000s feminism was stuck in respectability politics, and that's sadly, that is true. Um, I, I do recall, you know, back then when, when yeah, even women would, would hate on, you know, women in media, especially ones who were sexualized and such. And, and not really express a lot of empathy for, you know... Considering, you know, what is, what is the, um, you know, what are the pressures on this person to sexualize themselves in the media? Um, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, a lot of people couldn't look past that she did something like that. You know, and, and to, to be fair, you know, I, I try to always empathize with all minorities, all members of minority groups. Um, you know, basically... For a, a number of women, when they see a very sexualized woman in media, you know the the it changes it, it it yeah it alters expectations for you know um, all the all the men who see that are going to expect them to dress like that, perform sexual favors like that, and and these things. So I, I'm not saying that it doesn't make any sense. To, to, you know, you know, hypothetically, if uh, there were no sex workers, uh, you know, the, the, um, you know, maybe the, the, ah, I don't want to, I don't know if I want to get into such a, a thorny subject, and I didn't really prepare anything more than I already have said about it, but I just want to say, I do understand, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, that, they're all automatically wrong. Now, I realize that not everybody agrees on their analysis of the critical reception that this movie got. Now, I personally want to say, in terms of trying to view the movie on its own merits and properly expressing what you might think is wrong with it, in my opinion, you know, I, I know I've said something else before, but really, in my opinion, the critical reception to this movie, of all that I've seen, is the greatest dumpster fire, at least 50% of it. There's maybe 20% that's good, 30% that's fine, and 10% of it was written by people who don't understand percentages. Now, let's see. Um, yeah, so, uh, critic quotes. It's tight, compact screenplay punches right along a model of efficient, 
genre storytelling, screenwriter Diablo Cody, Oscar winner for Juno, has become lo a love her or hate her writer, and I'm not quite sure why. She certainly has a distinct specific vo voice and style, sure, but so do Tarantino and Mamet and Kevin Smith, and they don't get half the hate she does. I'd float a theory about sexism playing into it, but that's for another time and place. Yeah, there's definitely, there's a lot of misogyny in the in the response to, to this and to her in, in general. Some said that the way her characters talk is not how anyone talks for real in real life. Now, I was not in high school in 2009, but I was here on YouTube. I was watching a lot of YouTubers who talk about m movies and games, like the Spoonie one, the Nostalgia Critic, Nostalgia Chick, Crack, and they did talk in a way heavily resembling this, the constant pop culture references, trying to create new slang, or using slang that they share with the other YouTubers, the viewers, etc., but not society at large. Just not the, the cutesy girl stuff, because that kind of thing is viewed as negative. Like... I feel like this was almost trying to acknowledge that this is how, yeah, the the YouTube kind of thing, and then also add in this cutesy girl stuff. And you know, when you when you see people who really hate the the voice, a lot of the stuff they point to is the cutesy girl stuff. Like um, at one point, Jennifer says, in, instead of saying it hurts, she says, "I feel like boo boo," and you know, yeah, that's. That's cutesy girly, but, you know, what's wrong with that? That's like, like, you know, I don't tend to hang out with a lot of teenage girls uh, because I don't want to end up on a list, but, you know, as far as I understand, they do still say cutesy girly stuff, you know, after the, the age when they would, yeah. Now, to this day, even though Spoonie and Linzela sadly aren't that active anymore, that is how YouTubers, and, and I'm not going to get into the details of that. Um, I think Jesse Gender did a really good video on, on Linzela's. That is how YouTubers talk. Look at someone like Cody Johnston of Somewhere News, who was also on Cracked. I can't say for sure that anybody in high school does talk like that, but I'm certain a lot of high schoolers wish they could, wish they were watching or on YouTube instead of being in high school. Uh, let's see. The Yeah, that brings us to the... Oh, right, right. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's her... That's her voice and ear for dialogue. Um, yeah, I... I think she does a really solid job avoiding teenage stereotypes uh, in this. Like, this is... I remember a, a bunch of teen movies from the 2000s. This is so much better than the vast majority. Like, you know, this is the kind of thing where you watch it and it's like... That's possible. I didn't know that was allowed. We we can do that? We We're allowed... To make something so complex and say it's for teenagers? Like, if you wanted something complex in the 2000s, you really had to go outside of stuff that would appeal to, to teenagers. You know, there was there were teen movies and then there were complex movies. And this one actually is both. It's not just trying to be. Just, yeah. Um, the... Um, so yeah, the let's see, dialogue and the the yeah the the characters are distinct, even though you know there is this there there is something of a shared uh, um, you know yeah uh, multiple different characters talk in this in you know use this slang that Cody made up, but they are still like distinct and. Um, yeah, I thought some of the scenarios she comes up with and how she explores, like the exploration of issues, it's not perfect, but there's a lot of really, really excellent stuff here. That brings us to the direction. So this was directed by Karen Kusama. And let's see. Yeah, she she is still directing. Uh, that That's really good. As, you know, sadly, this movie did badly and, and hurt the careers of, uh, yeah, the the various. Um, let's see, I don't 
really know most of this stuff. I have barely heard, yeah, yeah, a bunch of TV. Um, what is, what is the invitation again? I, I, uh, let's see, so 2015, wow, that sounds very interesting. Okay, uh, yeah, I may well watch that if I get, um, I'm, I'm almost 100% certain it's not on Disney+, Plus, but I'll do a really, really quick check to make absolutely sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it would go on the list immediately. But, yeah. Um, I haven't watched Girl Fight, but apparently that movie is basically... You know, that's, that's a big part of why um, Michelle Rodriguez has a career. So that... You know, I'm I'm really grateful for that. I, I that's another where where people really hate her and seem to really struggle to separate her from her characters. Like, yeah, you know, a lot of the characters she plays are are kind of harsh and and like, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to be friends with them. But like, if you watch an interview with her, that you know, she's not actually this, you know. It's, it's, I'm not going to say that every single opinion of her, apparently she is one of the people who say that instead of, you know, spreading diversity using established characters, they should create new characters, which I disagree with. But yeah, um, I, I everything I've seen her in, I, I like her in. She's even good in Resident Evil Retribution, and that is not... There are... Almost everyone sucks in that movie. Even, you know, a, several of them are immensely talented. But they just... They're given nothing to work with. And you can kind of tell them they're... Like, if you're given nothing to work with, you either really have to bring something of, of your own, or you just kind of say, okay, I guess this job is just going to suck. Uh, I, I don't have much to... You know... She, I, I think she might be the only person in that movie who really, like, brings something and just, yeah, um, I wanted her to be in more of the movie. Um, even, at, you know, whenever she wasn't on screen, I just wanted the movie to end soon. Um, Karen Kusama did direct Eon Flux. Now, I have to admit, it has been years since I watched it. I remember it as being fine. Um, I saw... In, in researching this, I saw someone say that it was basic. It, it was a uh, it uh, it was a compelling exploration of masculinity and femininity, uh, and the the differences between. And yeah, um, I'm gonna have to next time I watch it, I will I will keep my eyes open for that. That's another you know for sure. Like I have it on DVD. If you you know. I've, at the time, I bought it because I was a really big fan of Charlie's Theron because of Monster. So I was like, okay, it it stars Charlie's... Yeah, I have to watch it. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you want to request that, I'll definitely... I'm happy happy to do that one. Um, now, let's see. So, so yeah, this is a movie for young women, by young women, about young women. And it's not trying to make young women look perfect. It, it's exploring some things that young women do that, according to young women, are wrong to do. You know, it's actually, like, it's wild looking at, like, some people, you know, some some people in, in reviewing this are just upset that it doesn't cater to the male gaze enough. And then you do have some that say, that, that basically seem to think, well, if it's by women, for women, and about women, then... It must be about making women look good. So why is it making some of the women look bad? And that's that's such a simplistic view of empowerment. Like, it's, you know, I've said before, and it bears repeating, I think one of the best superhero movies made with, like, a, a female focus is Birds of Prey because it allows women to be messy. It's not talk. It's it's not a movie that's about 
that if you're a woman, you have to be perfect, and if you're perfect, then you can be a superhero. It's a movie about trying to do some good, even if, you know, maybe you've made some mistakes, or maybe the situation you're in isn't great for, you know, for, for this or that reason. You know, yeah. Um, I've, yeah, I, I, um, I think it was Princess Weeks who pointed out it's, it's much better for women than something like Wonder Woman 1984, which, to be clear, is trying to, to, you know, it has, it has ideas about how to, to help women through representation. But, but yeah, you know, this is, this is a movie where it's, it's not, you know, the, the, the women are not exclusively good or evil, the men are not exclusively good or evil, you know, it's, yeah. It was very clearly a labor of love, you know, I've seen some behind-the-scenes footage, and clearly they really enjoyed making it, they had rapport, would tease and support each other, and let's see... Uh, yeah, this, I, I thought this was, so this is a Wikipedia quote. Box office analysts and critics debated whether, uh, debated the film's underperformance. Analyst Jeff Bach of Exhibitor Relations reasoned the film underperformed at the box office due to two reasons. At first, the first he said is the genre. Bach stated that Americans get horror and comedy, but with the idea of those two things together in one place, people suddenly get very dumb. The horror comedy genre is the toughest sell in Hollywood, he said. He noted films Tremor, Slither, Shaun of the Dead, Eight-Legged Freeze, and the Evil Dead series, and said that while many of those are considered critical and business successes, none of them have brought in the megabucks that a symbol horror, symbol horror or comedy can. In addition, he labeled the Scream franchise as more straight-up horror than comedy, and stated Zombieland's box office performance would determine the horror, the horror comedy's genre's current viability. I have to admit, um, usually when I see a trailer for a horror comedy, it the movie isn't always bad, but a lot of the trailers make the movies look bad. Uh, I honestly don't remember if there was, like, a, a boom in horror comedies after Zombieland. I, I did watch, I've watched Zombieland maybe three times, and the second one once in theaters. Um, yeah, and the first time I watched Zombieland, it was in theaters. Um... Yeah, but but yeah, for for sure, there's there's a yeah, and scream, yeah, like I uh, f I wouldn't necessarily say that scream is comedy. It's it's satire, you know. Like you're you're not necessarily like laughing your ass off at an incredibly funny joke, but you're like recognizing tropes and seeing how they're played with, toyed with in, you know, an inventive way more than there are outright jokes. So, some critic quotes. Um, yeah, a number of people have labeled this a feminist cult classic, uh, but it is also worth noting some feminists love it, others hate it. And let's see... Yeah, um, this is from a woman who appreciated it before me too, and she said, There's a feminist story hiding underneath a lot of junk. It's got tons of problems. And, let's see, um, uh, right, yeah, um, uh, various have said, There's not a lot of violence, nudity, laughs, or scares. Now, it's perfectly fine for us to disagree on movies, and maybe you legitimately did feel like this was just not scary, but I gotta say, I have no idea how you reached that conclusion. For a teen horror movie, this is definitely scary, and it is a teen horror movie. To be clear, I love teen horror movies. I could maybe see the claim that sometimes a while passes without scares, and some scares really take you by surprise, really shift the tone in an unexpected way, but there are a lot of scares in this, like... Yeah, you know, and, and yeah, there's there's scares at the start, at the middle, at the end, like, and, and the same goes for the comedy. Like, I really don't, I thought this was really, really scary, and I am, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of John Carpenter, stuff like The Thing, um, David Cronenberg, stuff like Videodrome, Existence, The Fly, um scanners you know movies that 
okay, Scanners isn't the scariest movie ever made, but but yeah, you know, I... And I'm not saying that this is quite as scary as those necessarily, but it is scary. I, again, by teen horror movie standards, this... Yeah. And yeah, uh, um... Yeah, I, I would say all the all the scares work for me. All the all the jokes work for me. Um, now, uh, yeah, okay. Some people say it's more of a parody than a horror movie. Yeah, I think that might have been from a from a two thousand nine review back when the, you know, I, I forget exactly who it was. I think it might have been the take. Maybe it was um, Cheyenne Lin. I think is how you pronounce her name. Um, but but um, yeah, one of one of them pointed out relatively recently that, you know, nowadays people are ready to accept, you know, you can have comedy while also doing a different genre, you know, but, but yeah, there was a while where they were seen as separate, that you couldn't mix th them together, and I also think that's part of why something like, you know, I, I acknowledge uh, a lot of people have loved um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid for many years, for, for decades, you know, longer than I've been alive, but there were some critics on release who didn't quite like it, and some yeah some people basically felt like oh it's it's too funny, and I agree that it is it, that movie has a lot of laughs. I was I was really cracking up watching that movie, but it also has a lot of tension and the the drama of it works. You know I I you know I I think you know that that movie was really ahead of its time and and so was this one and yeah today we do have movies that really mix different genres you know and and movies today that have elements of both horror and comedy um stuff like barbarian fresh i feel like there's at least one more uh let me think um let's see i have this i have a list a list not of the oh, I've missed, but of movies I watched on Disney Plus. So, let's see. I've noted when I watched it, so I could watch it again, like six months later, for the ones where I really want to. Um. Nope. Uh. Yeah. Prey is mainly uh, you know, horror, horror action. Um. Yeah, right, uh, no, yeah, yeah, Antlers is also primarily, um, yeah, yeah, I guess it is just, it's, it's Barbarian, Fresh, um, Not Okay, I would also say, is not only a comedy, you know, it is based, it is a dramedy, I guess, I, I'm not sure I would quite say it, it doesn't have many horror elements, but, but yeah, um, yeah, um, okay, so this is from a male reviewer. He said that he wished it focused on the indie band. Because, you know, we do not have enough movies that focus exclusively on men. We, we, let's, let's cool it with all these women-focused movies. No, 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 it's, it's, wow. I do not understand how you even, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, they go on to say, there's nothing here you haven't seen in The Faculty or Fright Night. Uh, they, they do so, they do say Juno was a lot better, so, you know, I don't know if that's covering up for not liking Diablo Cody, or if that's them saying that they do like her. Boy, I really miss when I was a child, and I thought that when people said something, they meant it, instead of, like, just intellectualizing to try to not sound bad when they're saying something bad. Anyway... Um, no, uh, you know, I like The Faculty, I love Fright Night, the, I mean, hopefully we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, must be talking about the original, because the remake came out after this movie, um, and, and once again, this is a 2009 review, um, yeah, you know, uh, I completely disagree, there are definitely things in this movie that are not in those, um, I will say, though, you know, some of the faculty does try to focus on the female perspective of high school, not uh, only the male, even though it is a horror movie. And again, a lot of horror movies for teenagers don't really have, yeah. Um, let's see. And yeah, I, I'm not sure I would compare this that much to Fright Night. Um... I, I can kind of see some elements, but 
Anyway, uh, yeah, some people say that uh, the first two Ginger Snaps movies are better. Haven't watched them. Um, it seems like, the uh, certainly the first Ginger Snaps, uh, seems like there's a lot of good stuff there. But, I mean, that movie... Yeah, not a spoiler to say, the first Ginger Snaps movie is about puberty and sisters. This is about trauma and um, BFFs. So, yeah, there's a, a lot of different... I think this... Um, yeah, someone said, this movie's like combining Ginger Snaps and Mean Girls. That there is a lot of... You know, again, I haven't watched those, but there is logic in what he says. Now, uh, let's see. Um, okay, some people say that uh, Karen Kusama's direction is heavy-handed. Um, so, yeah, yeah, they go on to say, a gifted filmmaker who seems unwilling to surrender to the exploitive trashiness of Cody's juicily derivative script. Like, I agree that there are references. I wouldn't really say it's hugely derivative um yeah yeah this I, I believe this was also a 2009 review this was a professional critic but yeah you know they watched the trailer they thought that the movie was supposed to be exploitive and then they you know criticized it for not being something that we, it was undersold as so yeah uh let's see um, photographed with a generous cold touch by M. David Mullen. Kusama fumbles Cody's oily puzzle peaches, pieces. <sighs> and the gory stuff plays too viscerally to enjoy in the good humored way the film seems. Wow. Yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah. This was a review that did not appreciate that you can do both horror and comedy in the in the same... You know, the movie goes back and forth between comedy and, and horror. And occasionally there's some, some very distinct overlap. Like, someone will do something horrific, but it's done in a kind of funny way. Um, yeah, maybe more than occasionally, but, but yeah. Um, but yeah, the gore is visceral. Uh, I, I thought it worked really well. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so the... Um, okay, yeah, so this person then goes on to say, Kusama doesn't show any flair for the genre, focused more on the parts than the whole. Ah, uh, no, I, I don't really agree. I, I, yeah, I disagree with most of the criticisms of, of her direction. Uh, right, here. Eon Flux is a small masterpiece, a sci-fi philosophical piece on masculine and feminine values. I found it rather engrossing throughout, and it only loses steam when it goes into action mode, which Kusama has little talent for. There is no doubt most, this is no doubt most due to Kusama since the writer, uh, wow. Um, oh, oh, right, yeah. Eon Flux's writers are hopeless. It's incredible what she did with such... Yeah, not a fan of that term. Um, but yeah, bad writers. Uh, I also heard her version was cut by the studio, so her original vision might have been even superior. Purely based on watching Jennifer's body in Eon Flux, she is a profound director whose skills outweigh her ambition greatly. But I'm sure she's hard at work getting better. Very interested in her next movies. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, this person. I laughed almost nonstop while watching it. It was perfectly funny and gross. I give it a 4 out of 5. That, yeah. Seconded. Um, I really don't want to detail the opening to this movie. But I do want to say that, like, it immediately gets... Like, you, you very quickly get, uh, you know, you, you realize, you know, in part that it's supposed, you know, you, you realize that it's in part a horror movie and in part a comedy, and yeah, um, you know, you find yourself, um, 
the, the just yeah you you got to see what what happens next so i'm not going to give away whether the what it whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending but if it's what came before uh i think the ending is great uh no deus ex machina no convenient writing so uh this does not it doesn't have a post credit scene but there is this short bit after the end credits start rolling which in 2009 was not hugely common and i guess it's still only common in in comic comic book movies um keep watching a, a little further after the the end credits start you will know when it's fine to stop um yeah so that brings us to the characters so let's see there we go yes megan fox she plays jennifer check and yeah uh the reason she agreed to the movie was her love for the script i think what i loved about the movie is it's so unapologetic and how completely inappropriate it is at all times that was my favorite part about the script and about the character it's fun to be able to say the shit that she got to say and get away with it and how people find it charming and asked how acting in a film like this is different from acting in Transformers, Fox said, there's no distractions, like there's no robots to distract you from whatever performance I do give. Um, and then she goes on to say, so if it's terrible, you're gonna fucking know that it's really terrible. I really, I think she did an excellent job. She said, despite this aspect of the business being intimidating, she enjoyed portraying the character. I was just trying to have fun with it, and I felt like I was able to make fun of my own image as to how some people might perceive Megan Fox to be. I'm usually not a fan of celebrities referring to themselves in third person, but yeah, I do think that was the rare occurrence where that makes perfect sense. To prepare for her role as... Uh, right, that is kind of a spoiler. So yeah. In balancing out the film's horror with humor, she said re she relied heavily on Diablo Cody's script and Karen Kusama's direction to pull it off, stating, "I have a very specific sense of humor. Things that I think are funny that aren't going to f aren't going to fly with Middle America. It's going to eliminate some of the audience. So you need there someone there to tell you you can't do that." And right, so the. Um, hmm, does that? Oh, right, that's, a, yeah. So, yeah, um, her character expresses uh, a certain viewpoint. This is, this is a, um, yeah, a lot of men think that attractive young women are replaceable, and here's an attractive young woman who thinks that men are replaceable, which is a fun reversal. And it's also, you know, it's a media medium, a genre and a subgenre where attractive women are considered replaceable. So, yeah, really appreciate that this movie does not agree with that assessment. Right, and this was a really great, great quote. Unfair is any criticism of her acting ability. Before now, all we've ever seen her in is Transformers. Listen up, Dumbo. If all you ever saw of, of John Turturro was Transformers, you'd think John Turturro was a crappy actor too. Absolutely true. I, I hear. I, I can't possibly bring myself to watch those movies. I gave completely up on Michael Bay after watching The Island. Uh, and that's not actually, I'll admit, that's not his worst. But, uh, yeah, I've watched everything he made up to and including The Island, and no mas, I can't take it anymore. Now, Megan Fox was incredibly funny on Two and a Half Men. Like, every single joke she delivered landed, none fell flat. She's great in the Love the Way You Lie music video. Other than those, this is the first thing I watch her in, and it is the first movie I watch her in. I haven't been avoiding movie her movies for her, but Jonah Hex looked bad in trailers and such, and like I said, you know, 
Oh, right, I did actually, yeah. I stopped watching Michael Bay movies with The Island, and yeah, that movie does have some good qualities, but I gotta say, after watching Armageddon, Pearl Harbor, and Bad Boys 2, I just could not get myself to keep watching Michael Bay movies. And I, I think I meant to stop after Bad Boys 2, but I had to see if he could do a half-decent job on The Island, which is a clever concept. You know, it's not really a... You, you shouldn't really brag if there are people who would rather watch the MST3K movie than your movie. Like, seriously, if you haven't watched parts of the Clonus Horror, don't, except with MST3K. But if you watch it, you'll realize, wow, the island is just straight up. Like, it's it's the movie with a, with a better title and better production. Uh, yeah. Now, one of the problems with celebrity is that the moment that you have a member of one or more minority groups and they present to the world as a musician, actor, etc., then people who hate minorities can simply claim that they think the celebrity is a bad musician, actor, etc., and go after the minority. Megan Fox is a target, and especially was in the late 2000s. Members of minority groups are held to a much higher standard. Straight white cis men are considered inherently superior. Everyone else has to prove their humanity. And in America, the prevailing strain of Christianity is a very moralistic, anti-sex one, so a lot of young straight men, when they look at an attractive woman, they feel desire toward her, but then feel bad for that desire. And instead of realizing that maybe it's that type of Christianity that's wrong, they blame the women that make them feel desire, which is also, you know, yeah, there's a lot of misogyny in the Bible and in Christianity, you know, and in the other parts of that make up Christianity. And when you add in the sexual frustration felt by a lot of men when they see an attractive woman that they know that they won't be able to have sex with, that gets multiplied. Throughout the 80s and 90s, action movies were dominated by white men from Europe and America, many of whom were white, and while some of them certainly could, under the right circumstances, deliver solid acting, Arnold Schwarzenegger as Conan the Terminator, Sylvester Stallone as Rocky and Rambo, the majority of the movies that they did didn't deliver, they didn't deliver particularly good acting in. Throughout the 80s and 90s, and to this day, there were also a ton of horror movies with terrible acting. And sure, some critics were pointing out that action movies used to have better acting, like the Bond movies before, you know. But the general audience ate it up. But the very moment that women deliver less than stellar acting, they are criticized harshly. I love a lot of the acti action and horror movies that have bad acting, but I don't have unfair standards based on minority groups. And and to be clear, there, there are... Um, What's the word? Um, guilty pleasures. I don't consider them as, as good as good movies. This is closer to a good movie than a... Th this, yeah, this is closer to a legitimately great movie than a guilty pleasure for me. In 2009, Megan Fox was being called ungrateful for the movies that she did, the, the people who hired her. It's born out of this idea that women should be extremely grateful for the things men do for them, a misogynistic idea that doesn't consider that under patriarchy, a lot of women start out with nothing, where a lot of men, especially white men, start out with something. And historically, men in power have victimized all women, so the idea that they should be grateful is fundamentally flawed. And it does, of course, also assume that the woman is, in fact, given something rather than that she is earning it by talent. So I don't watch enough Megan Fox movies to be able to speak to her talent in general, but in this movie, she definitely shows a lot of talent. And, uh, you know, I hear that in the, in the movies that... Um, Let's see, uh, she wasn't in Mean Girls, but she was in C Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen, I think it was called, with um, Lindsay Lohan, who also gets ridiculous hatred. Um, I've heard that she's excellent in that, and I could definitely see. So, one thing that people point to as evidence that she's ungrateful is when she, in interviews, said that Michael Bay was abusive to her and Shia LaBeouf, putting them in literally physically dangerous situations. A lot of people forget that she actually followed up by saying that Bay is shy and awkward when he's not directing. To respond to that by calling her ungrateful is, as, is admitting that you don't think there's something wrong with men hurting women. I don't love that she compared Michael Bay to actual dictators, including one of the all-time worst, Hitler. But people focused on that and ignored the content. And that's actually... It, yeah, that's because they knew that 
if they actually engaged with what she said, they would either have to make excuses for horrible behavior or, and I think we can all agree this was completely unacceptable, they'd have to admit that Megan Fox was correct about something. And it actually, um, let's see, recently, uh, Jennifer Lawrence who also gets ridiculous hatred. Um, I will admit, uh, she does seem to have caught a, a bad case of foot-in-mouth disease, but other than that she occasionally says something, you know, like, the, the hatred she gets is ridiculous. The thing she said was that before Hunger Games, there weren't really female-led uh, action movies, and the, the, yeah, other people have, have spent time, you know, Organized Chaos did a really excellent review, and he, where he, among other things, pointed out, they completely ignored the point she's making. She wasn't saying, like, could she have phrased it better? Sure. She probably misspoke, and the point she was making is that there is a huge disparity. Women make up 50% of all people. On the planet, at least hypothetically. I know some countries have, you know, fewer. Uh, I forget. Does China still have the the? Yeah, uh, for for a while, very few uh, women were being born and raised in in China because they, you know, they they had the single child policy, which I forget if they still have. And the um, yeah, a lot of parents didn't want girls that they would, you know, because the society places more value on men. But, yeah, hypothetically, about 50%. Certainly not way, way less. And yet there are way more male-centered action movies than female-centered. And again, it's not about acting talent, because a lot of the, the male-centered ones have terrible acting. And I, you know, I'm a recovering fan of, ah, that's a terrible joke, I, I like movies featuring, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, I've never thought that they had good acting, but I found them enjoyable, entertaining. And, yeah, you know, the moment that a, a female action movie fails, then suddenly it's not that, oh, I guess... A lot of action movies suck, and occasionally one's going to fail because it's a ridiculously oversaturated market. No, suddenly, up, oh, I guess, if oh, if we put a woman in an action movie, it's going to fail. So, you know, for sure, a movie like Catwoman, the 2004 movie, is terrible. But that's not because of the aspect that it's, you know, trying to empower women. It's doing a bad job trying to empower women. And, I mean, have you seen anything else directed by, I want to say his name is Pitoff? Like, when he was just, like, let's see, was he a cinematographer? I think he was a cinematographer. When he was just doing that, he, like, that he has a knack for. I, I believe he he was the DP on uh, Alien Resurrection, like, you know, Overall, not that great of a movie, but you gotta admit, it's pretty well shot. But then he started directing movies of his own, and they are just... Nigh on what? Nigh on unwatchable? Yeah. They're bad, is what I'm trying to say. They're, they're, they're really not very good. I, I gotta get the title of... Yeah, it's called Vidoc. If you try to watch it, just have some Tylenol nearby, because it's a headache-inducing movie. Yeah, uh, Vidoc, Catwoman, Catwoman, and then he directed a TV movie, and a video? Is that a... Okay, so it's not a... Is it a music video? I can't tell. It's weirdly... It's, um, Okay, it says music. Short music are the genres. Now, um, let's see. Yeah, plenty of men, including hated ones like Shia, have criticized Michael Bay without the kind of backlash there was against Megan Fox. It's misogyny. Frankly, a lot of the men who get who got really angry at Megan over what she said about Bay didn't actually pay attention to the details of what she said. And, you know, they're just 
upset because they like Michael Bay. They were upset... Uh, yeah, they were upset because once she criticized Bay, it reminded them of every single time a woman has made them feel small, whether they turned them down for a date or bullied them or whatever. Being turned down is frustrating, and I get being angry about bullying, but taking it out on someone who had nothing to do with that is wrong. So, yeah, a lot of male audiences did not like the movie on release. I'm not going to be the first or last feminist to point out that the movie wants to empathize with Jennifer, not gawk at her. The whole film works hard to get people to look past Megan Fox's physical appearance, and the studio and initial viewing audience, including critics, simply couldn't, maybe wouldn't, do that. There are a number of reviews by straight cis men where they spend a really long time talking about Megan Fox's body, with whether or not they find her attractive, basically talking about her like she's a menu item they didn't enjoy at McDonald's, objectifying her, spitefully. It has the vibe of... Right after the school teacher is told the bullies not to bully their target, they bully them even harder. And yeah, in 2009, a lot of people in the mainstream were not ready to view attractive women in movies as anything more than attractive women. Especially in the case of Megan Fox, who was viewed as being defined by her entrance in the first Transformers movie. Somehow that lesson was not learned from the example of Helen Mirren, who started out her career conventionally attractive doing nude scenes, and now, I'm not sure how early in her career, but I know she did nude scenes. She's now respected as a highly talented actress. Or maybe the lesson they learned was that when you're no longer young, then you can be talented. I haven't watched the movie she did when she was young, but I hear that she did incredible work back then as well. You know, I, I actually, until relatively... You know, I guess it was maybe two years ago. It was it was Young Turks who pointed out this this old interview when she had just done the movie, and this male interviewer, like he, you know, at first he almost seemed to feel bad about saying it, and she like teased him a little. She could tell, you know, this is not going anywhere well, and I I'm not gonna let you know. He opened the door. She's she's telling him walk through it, and. The, the, yeah, you know, I, I forget the exact words, but his, the, basically what he was expressing was, how am I supposed to respect you now that I've seen you naked? And it just, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. And honestly, before that, I didn't even know that she acted when she was younger. I thought that she only... I, I never heard anyone talk about her old movies. You know, people... You know, I've, I've known that she was a talented actress, you know, for many, many... For, for decades by now. Uh, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of her stuff, and she is tremendously talented. But I never even heard people discuss stuff she made when she was... You know... I, th I think another example, yeah, yeah, uh, what, what's the name of, um, ah, I think, yeah, I'm gonna make sure I don't get her name wrong, so, uh, is this, is this right? That's not right. Uh, I guess I have the wrong, yeah, yeah, I have the wrong, um, ah, crap, what's the movie called, then? The movie is called Night Port. Yeah, not Char not Charlotte Gainsborough, Charlotte Rampling. Before I watched The Night Porter, which you know, my dad encouraged, um he he watches basically every movie that's about Nazis. Um he's been trying to basically figure out how do we prevent Nazism from taking hold ever again since he was a child. He grew up in the post-war period. And, yeah, you know, that was one of the movies that... And, and, yeah, before I watched that, I didn't even know Charlotte Rampling did movies when she was younger. It's, it's almost like, like... Like, people can't quite... Like, like they, they... And, and right, uh, uh, right. Not everybody knows what The Night Porter is. Uh, she appears nude in, in that movie, at least partially nude. And, you know, it, I, it is actually a good movie. It's not just using, you know, it's it's not just trying to, to, it's not wank material. It is a genuinely intelligent movie. 
and you know, the, I mean, the fact that people don't today talk about nude scenes that Helen Mirren and Charlotte Rampling did, you know, decades ago, I'm not saying that there's something, that that's inherently weird or something, you know. It would probably be weirder if they were constantly bringing it up. And I only bring it up to make this point. What I'm saying is, it's as if the, the you know, I, I acknowledge there are different phases to a career, and the roles that Rampling and Mirren get today are not the roles that they got, you know, yeah, half a century ago. But I just find it fascinating that you have these actors who were conventionally attractive and, and young ones, and now they're really respected for their talent, and yet, when a new conventionally attractive woman comes along, they they start like it's it's like uh, uh, you know they they get done drawing this complex image in their heads of of an actress on the etch sketch, and then you know they they shake it when a new actress comes along, and just assume you know I I so many actors who actresses who have proven that they can act. Both before and after, the, they've received this ridiculous hatred. You know, as a, just as a general rule, like, maybe we need, as a culture, to kind of get past, like, outright hating, you know, create people who... Ah, okay, I'm going to go ahead and say artist. Unless they actually spread a really hate, hateful, you know... Like, I don't think we should forget that uh, Mel Gibson is a, an anti-Semite, you know, and I think the fact that he has made anti-Semitic statements, you know, that combined with the fact that the last, uh, yeah, the Passion of the Christ, not, not the last um, temptation, yeah, um, you know, that's a really anti-Semitic movie. That's a problem. But instead, you have all these people talking about how awful this actor... Like, like I said, I don't love that Megan Fox used the, the dictator, you know, comparison. But if she actually... Like, she mentions that she and Shia were put in actually dangerous conditions and like I only heard that part of the quote when I did research for this movie like I remember hearing yeah yeah in 2009 you know everyone was quoting oh she said Michael Bay is like Hitler uh, you know and she even you know she, yeah she got fired from the th you know she was supposed to do the third movie and she got fired uh, you know for that interview and, yeah, I'm not going to bring that into it. I, um, yeah, I wish she hadn't said dictator. I wish she had just said he pushes us too hard or something and, and then brought up. But, you know, honestly, regardless, they would have found something to freak out over. You know, right now, Republicans are freaking out over, oh, you know, Biden left, you know, there, he had uh, uh, classified documents. He gave them back when they were discovered. Like, immediate. Like this is not the same thing as with Trump. And besides, now suddenly they agree that there's something wrong with, with having uh, classified documents. You know, what was it? I think, ah, crap. I forget which of the late night shows did. But, but one of them, you know, said, Republicans think that you shouldn't have, you know, classified documents. And they've believed that since Monday. Uh, yeah, let's see, um, yeah, you know, to this day, scenes of Megan Fox in this movie are used in video compilations of hot women. Thankfully today, it does seem like people are more ready to see women in movies as full people. We see this through Margot Robbie and Anya Taylor-Joy. Honestly, Joy might have played Jennifer if the movie were made today for the first time. 
I'm not sure she would have been quite as perfect, but, you know, she does sometimes take very unflattering roles, even though she could choose to just take roles based on her being conventionally attractive. Uh, although, I really, you know, I've heard that she herself is self-conscious about that, and you know, I, I hope that, I, I, I'm not going to claim that, you know, there's... Uh, I realize that there's a huge amount of pressure on women for for their appearance, and apparently she was bullied because of her appearance, which just... I think that's one of the worst. Um, I, I... If you bully someone else for your appearance, fuck you. You deserve no empathy from anyone. I don't... The fact that you might have been bullied as well... The moment you choose to bully someone for their appearance, fuck you. And let's see. Right, 2009 Megan Fox was absolutely perfect to play Jennifer Check. And that's not only my words. Diablo Cody and Megan Fox have said that as well. Diablo told Megan, you have a mystique. And Megan says, it was like it was about me at the time. And, yeah, like, I, I, if you don't like, like, if you hate this movie, if you think it deserves a zero out of ten, it, it should just, you know, I can accept that. But if you actually think that she doesn't have a mystique to her, if you think that she can't come across at, like, there's, yeah, it's, it's, it is haunting. In, in this movie, just, yeah. And, yeah, um, Megan Fox pointed out, I, I think this might have been in the, the they did, like, um, 10-year anniversary, the, the um, in 2019, she and Diablo Cody sat down for an interview, and there was also a, ah, was that a, that might have been an um, Q&A, not an AMA, of uh, her, of, of Megan Fox and Kusama. Yeah, Megan Fox said, Some reviews from when it came out just misrepresented the movie. It was like they didn't even watch it. And I have to agree. I've read them, and it is just like... I mean, you you wrote this before you watched the movie, didn't you? And then you didn't want to change anything. Like, just, yeah. Oh, right, and uh, some people said, you know... Yeah, so... To anyone who doesn't think there should be a hot girl running around with the robots, if you want to hate someone for that, hate Bay. It's not like Fox broke into his house, took his family hostage, and demanded she be put in the movies. And if you think she's a bad actress, be mad at him for not hiring a better one. You know, all major action movies now have at least one conventionally attractive woman. It's up to the director of each one to get one who is talented. You know, it's it's clearly, like, I watch a lot of MCU movies, and they clearly really want to make sure that the women they cast are talented. I'm not 100%. Are there any that are just, like, not particularly talented? Like, I'm, I'm not going to claim that th the MCU has never put someone who isn't talented in one of their movies. I mean, fuck. Elon Musk was in Iron Man 2, and he has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt there are maybe a few, th there are a couple of things that he's good at, and then there are a lot of things that he has no business doing, and he refuses to just accept that he should not be doing them. Now, Amanda Seyfried plays Anita Needy Lesnicki, and... Yeah, uh, they say, you know, she's the plain Jane best friend to Fox's character. And she has an infatuation with Jennifer. Seyfried said, it was a relief to play the nerdy role opposite Fox. Being a lead like Megan, you have that weird pressure of feeling like you have to look attractive. In this movie, I didn't worry about any of that shit. I don't want to play the one that everybody is supposed to want to have sex with. Now, I met to copy in and I just now realized that I didn't so I am really quickly gonna look up Amanda Seyfried so let's see uh there are definitely yeah a number of these are not 
uh, apparently a lot of young women, or uh, a lot of women love the Mamma Mia movies, so that's great. Oh, that's right, yeah, she is in Ted 2. Yeah, she does, yeah, she she's good in Ted 2. She does what is asked of her in A Million Ways to Die in the West. Like, that's not really a movie that has a lot of empathy for the, the women. Right, she played Linda Lovelace in Lovelace. She does a really solid job there. Oh, yeah, in Time, she's great. Yeah, I, I don't know how I... I've, I have seen her in in a number of things and yeah I've I've never yeah yeah she uh, she has impressed me in everything every single thing I've seen her in and yeah she's great here you know she does do a good job as the the nerdier of, of the two Adam Brody plays Nikolai Wolf. The filmmakers had hoped to cast an actual rock musician to portray Nikolai Wolf with Pete Wentz of Fall Out Boy, Joel Madden of Good, Lo Good Charlotte being their top choices. One Tree Hill star Chad Michael Murray. Mm, I could see that, yeah. Was also considered for the role in... Let's see. Right, and Johnny Simmons was reported to be cast. And... Yeah, yeah. And then Brody was cast and Simmons accepted the role of Chip Dove. I thought he did perfect as Chip Dove, so I'm really glad that the I I, I gotta say I would be interested. Like, uh, there's not like a um, audition tape of him playing. Um, okay, so so Johnny Simmons uh, audition for Nikolai Wolf. Ah, uh, not as far as I can tell. No. Yeah, I, I I would definitely be interested. Like, if it's, maybe it's on a, a, you know, a DVD special feature or something. Like, I would I would like to watch that. I I would be interested, because the way he plays Chip is hugely different from, from how Brody plays Nikolai. Brody did not perform his own visuals, vi vocals, saying, My singing voice is still going through puberty. They gave me a singing lesson or two, and it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's not anything anyone would choose to hear. His vocals were provided by Ryan Levine, who also played another member of the band. And, yeah, one of the critics said, The band members think they're above everybody else, just like they do in real life, and it's very funny. I really, really enjoyed Adam Brody in this. I, uh, uh, I think this and Shazam, I'm pretty sure those are the only two. Yeah, I, I don't think I've seen him in anything else. I know he was on the OC, which is really, really hated. I I know almost nothing about that show other than that he was apparently on it. He was hilarious, both here and in in Shazam. Like I, he's gonna be in Shazam too, and I'm really looking forward to to that as well. He was so freaking funny here. Like there's this. One of the, yeah, uh, ah, crap, do I want to give, ah, I don't think I want to give that away, I, uh, but, but yeah, he just, like, he is, he is so incredibly funny, there's this thing of, like, when, yeah, the way he looks at, at people, like, he, he's, he plays, he and the band play at this, right, I, uh, forget if I mentioned, but yeah, it, it's set in this small, you know town he and the the rest of the band are supposed to be like this big thing you know they live in the city and they come to this small place and just the way that he's looking at some of the people like there's one part where he's even like he's having a conversation and he's like looking like oh my god i can't believe i'm actually talking to this person yeah yeah uh-huh uh oh wow that's just that it's rough on the eyes and the ears. Oh wow! Could you could you shut up so we can play? So we can go home because I really don't want to be here. Oh wow! Why did I agree to this? Just like his eyes are begging for mercy, and it is the funniest fucking thing because he chose. He chose to do this. Like nobody 
twisted his arm or anything. He chose to do this and he is hating it and it is so funny. Just, yeah, I, I really, um, yeah. And yeah, Johnny Simmons plays Chip Dove. He is dating Needy, which I, you know, even just having the nerdy character dating someone and he never like there's no sense of like ah oh, he wishes he could be no no he legitimately feels for her he he expresses concern and yeah yeah like he really does have feelings for her and she for him and they don't like yeah i i really appreciate this because because it is like you see a lot of movies where like the nerd doesn't or isn't dating anyone and I mean, maybe that's true for a number of people, but there's plenty of cases where that's not true at all. And, and yeah, uh, they, they have such great chemistry. They were adorable and adorkable together. J.K. Simmons is in this. I'm not just kidding. He plays Mr. Rublevsky, and I don't even know where to begin. Like... Okay, so I realize, I'm sure, he's he's had a long career, he's been in a bunch of stuff that I haven't seen. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, in uh, in The Terminator, in Terminator Genesis, he's not. But I'm used to him being this kind of intense hard-ass, you know. To me, he is J. Jonah Jameson. And the, the you know, and I, I haven't watched... Th uh, the musician one, um... Crap, I forget what it's called, but I'm sure you, you know, you know, he's like a uh, teacher and the the young male lead is learning or not. I'm not sure he's learning, but he's like go, going to a higher level of playing drums. And yeah, um, so yeah, I this this isn't the only time I've seen J.K. Simmons not be super intense, but it is still like and he has hair he has curly hair, and and he has this this like hook for a hand, and there's this this point where he's like trying to trying to comfort the kids, and like one of them is is like tearing up, and he he does you know he he's he you know he does the he's trying to be a good teacher he's trying to be you know, helpful, so he reaches, you know, he, he's, he's, like, getting the, the, the kid, like, a, a, a little tissue and, and handing over, but he's doing it with the little, the, the claw thing, so it's like this, you know, it's, it's, it looks, it was really, really funny, um, yeah, that's, that's one of the times where it's very, very inappropriate. Amy Sedaris, that's right, that was her. I thought I recognized her. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she plays Tony Lesnicki, the, the mother of Needy. Right, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think I already mentioned, yeah. And Needy is her nickname. Anita is her real name, but a lot of people call her Needy, and... Some people apparently didn't really... Like, first of all, I don't know how you get through this whole movie not realizing that her real name is Anita. Again, like, okay, you just admit it. You wrote your review before watching the movie, and then you thought what you wrote was so funny that you didn't want to adjust it after. Because the movie makes clear on multiple occasions, like, very early on, she says, My real name is Anita, and then it pans across a paper where it is written... Anita Lesnik, like, you really, and, and don't even, don't tell me that you fell asleep because it's like two minutes in or something. Yeah, I, uh, a lot of people call her Needy. It's her nickname. Some people don't respond to their real name. They only want to be called their nickname. And yes, so, you know, even her mother calls her Needy. It's just, like... I feel like a bunch of people writing critical stuff of this movie just aren't really paying attention to what teenagers are like. Because there's a lot of stuff in this that's just... That's what they're like. Chris Pratt. Baby Chris Pratt is in this. And, yeah, I... 
it's it's wild. I mean, to me, he probably is always going to be Bright from Everwood. Uh, let's see the the last name, first name Bright, last name uh, Abbott. Right, Bright Abbott. Um, yeah, you know, but yeah, this was this was after that, before the the whole um, Guardians thing. I think wasn't this also before he did that other show? I, I believe so. And yeah, he's he's also really really good in this. Uh, let's see. Uh, Juan Reidinger plays Dirk. He's also great. He has some really great reaction shots. Valerie Tien plays Chastity. She's also really good. Aman Johal as Amit. Yeah, made an impression. And I think yeah, I don't wanna I don't wanna give that away. Um, but yeah, um, and other critics than myself have said. You know, the, the excellent characters in this. And, yeah, there there are uh, some instances in this where the whole, um, d d where diversity, you know, the, the, the high school itself is ethnically diverse. And, yeah, you know, every so often characters, you know, sometimes very unflattering, you know, will make very unflattering comments. And that's another, like, some people felt that the, the movie was too harsh. And, and you know, uh, yeah, other critics have already pointed out, it's kind of just represent, like, you haven't been in high school recently, have you? Since If, if you think that the, the high schoolers in this are, are harsh, that's, yeah. Um, uh, and, yeah, it's just, it's representative and yeah you know every so often we'll get a sort of and i i acknowledge you know i i'm glad that today they're trying like um there's also a lot of diversity on for example the disney plus ms marvel show there there's a, a lot of faces and voices that are you know south asian and and such and that one has a lot more, like, it, it doesn't, there's not a huge amount of, like, bullying based on, you know, bullying of them based on that. And when there is something, a character will call it out. You know, I think that is better today. But I'm not going to hate on a 2009 movie for doing, like, that was what teen movies were doing at the time there was not a huge amount of empathy this, this frankly has way more empathy maybe that's why they noticed it as much as they did you can find way more hateful youth oriented movies from the 2000s than this one i mean honestly some of the some of the um some of the stuff in american pie one and two it's just horrendous way way worse than anything in this and, and, and yeah, I, I've heard way less calling out of that. And, um, yeah, you know, the fact that this has both, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of empathy for minorities, but also we see some bully minorities. And, and there's also, like, the people in this who are bullying are usually show like, there are... There are characters that you might think, oh, they're going to be really awful, and then, like, you find out they, they really aren't. Like, um, Jennifer is a bully, but it's not really a movie full of bullies and with, like, constant... And, and yeah, the fact that there is so much empathy, not a huge amount from Jennifer in the movie for minorities, and then you have Jennifer, the, you know, this conventionally attractive young white woman who's bullying others, that actually really underlines that, you know, there is a, there is an alternative, like, other people are, yeah, more empathetic. Now, so, 
let's see. And yeah, um, Yeah, uh, uh, some critics of this movie think that the movie does not s sufficiently criticize the, the, uh, the bullying and such. It just represents the way people talk, but it doesn't criticize them. And I, I do... <sighs> More could be done in, in that regard. I, I will acknowledge that. The Cinematography by... M. David Mullen. Now, right, so yeah, he uh, he's done some Westworld, The Love Witch, which, uh, yeah, I've heard some really good things about. Um, Kyle, crap, what's his last, I always forget his last name because I don't think he particularly likes... Going by, so yeah, his, his, ch that's right, yeah, he actually, yeah, Kyle Cauldron has, you know, done, done a video on the, the Love Witch, and he really, really liked it, so, yeah, that's a, that's a really good sign. He has very high standards. He uh, did. He DP'd some Mad Men. I gotta admit, most of this stuff I really am not familiar. Oh, The Good Wife. I've heard good things about that as well. Stay cool. I guess that might be about what I know of the stuff that. Yeah, so the, yeah, he, he does a really great job. Like, you can definitely tell he knows how to shoot a horror movie. And the editing is in by Plummy Tucker. And I, yeah, I'm not sure. I know. Oh, uh, they edited uh, some Yellow Jackets. The Invitation, so... Kusama likes working with them, and Eon Flux. Yeah, the that's that's a good and and girl fight. That's a really good sign when when someone sticks around with the same director for for so long. You know, keeping in mind some of these movies are bigger than others. So, you know, basically, she could have Karen Kusama could have been like. I want someone else. Uh, you know, I, um, I don't know if I want to get into, okay, yeah, so, uh, briefly, I gotta get his name right, 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 yeah. So, um, yeah, Brian Singer, by now we know, is pretty scummy. Not because he's gay, but because he sexually assaults. He replaced, I want to say, was it maybe the composer? He replaced at least one person between the first and the second X-Men movie. And I do understand because he did basically, he needed someone who could handle the bigger, I, yeah, it, don't, hold, don't hold me to the composer. It might be someone else, but there was at least one person where he, yeah. You know, because the second X-Men movie is much bigger, and basically he needed to make sure that the person he hired for the job could actually do the job. You know, I, I hope that didn't create a um, friction between them, because it is... The, the guy who did the first movie is talented, but he wasn't as big as the guy who replaced him. Now... Uh, yeah, so the budget and box office, so yeah, I, um, this, this was made on 16 million, and it shows, and it only made 31.6 million, and, you know, part of it is the, the, basically, 
the marketing tried to draw in young men because the the mistaken belief that that was Megan Fox's primary fan base at the time, and Megan Fox has, has called that out and said no, that it was actually young women who were really big fans of her. And yeah, young women were given no reasons to to watch this movie in the marketing, so a lot of them didn't, and a lot of the men who went didn't. You know, the the movie isn't really for young men. And so they they only went to see it once. They told their friends not to see it. And yeah. Now, this was shot on multiple locations, including Minnesota, Vancouver. Yeah. And, and it gets a lot out of these... Like, there's a, there's a very, ah, what's the word? It feels like it really is in this small town in America that it's set, even though, you know, a lot, a lot of the people who, who did this have worked on movies that aren't set in small towns, they're set in big cities and such. And, and yeah, it really helps the 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 grounding and the way like it it they bring up the outside world and they like one of one of the things is that this band live in the city and yet they came out to this you know place far out in the yeah now that brings us to the music so it was composed by or the yeah the music was handled by Stephen Barton and Theodore Shapiro now Barton composed for Jedi Survivor Star Trek Picard okay so yeah he's done a number of games he does genre music and he does it really well and Theodore Shapiro, let's see. Also Yellow Jackets. Let's see. Trolls 2. Bombshell, yeah. The, the, hmm, Collateral Beauty. Well, and, yeah. The, you know, they, they do a really solid job. On this the the music really fits and yeah uh, th th a critic quote from someone who didn't actually like the film they liked that it had an 80s horror film score combined with contemporary and that's very true and actually uh, right here on YouTube 45 and a half minutes worth of the soundtrack and yeah you really get a sense of I, I always try to say watch the movie first but yeah, it is worth listening to separately from the movie, and yeah, I th I thought the music really worked. Like it really placed it in this reality of like small town kind of teenage high school, you know. And and that is also that is also part of it. Jennifer is you know really really popular, and and a lot of the the guys are really attracted to her. But the, you know, she is ultimately still in this small town that's not, yeah. And, let's see. Right, yeah, and it combines original score with licensed music to great effect. The sound design, like, there's some really gnarly, nasty noises connected to the, the horror I don't think I really want to get too much into just let's say that the human body can be broken in some very visually like viscerally effective ways that make substantial amounts of noise and that's that that is that is part of the horror here the the just horrifying things that that just yeah 
now so so yeah the the comedy you know there's there's inappropriate stuff there are like there there's wit there are puns there's this slang that is created there are jokes based on like people the, the, yeah miscommunication and and that kind of thing now yeah so the the pacing i personally really felt like it worked i i've seen some say that they felt like the movie was longer than it is i could i can kind of see what they mean but but yeah you know it's a movie that it grabs your attention very early in the movie and yeah i would say it's interesting throughout i have seen some say that the middle is perhaps the the weakest third i have no idea who that is but i guess i should go find out jehovah's witnesses i didn't know we still had those here it's just it's been years i'm not saying we like drove them out with uh, you know pitchforks and yeah that was that was voted down anyway back to jennifer's body so yeah um the movie is 96 minutes long without end credits and 103 with them and yeah i would personally say that it it kept moving enough there was always something interesting and uh right i sometimes try to give try, try to suggest how much you should watch so let me just really quickly i swear i won't spend forever on this just really quickly see okay yeah i would say maybe the first 35 minutes and if if at that point if you really don't care about what happens next yeah you may as well stop watching i'm not sure it's really going to have something that really hook you in after that so let's see the um yeah the, for me personally the best element was definitely the exploration of themes now okay so i i try to always pick something as a worst aspect to to force myself to say something negative about movies that i really love yeah i mean I, I'm not sure I really have, I, uh, no, no, I, I can't really think of anything that's just, yeah. Now, uh, yeah, so the, the, you know, if you look at other, if you look at critical reviews, they tend to say that it's not funny, not scary, and not sexy. I agree that it isn't particularly sexy, but I, you know, it, it wasn't trying to be. And I, I understand, you know, a lot of people don't look past marketing. And uh, uh, sometimes I worry I sound full of myself. I, I really don't mean to be. I'm, I'm just saying I, I get that that's not universal i think this is extremely funny and scary personally now the thing i was for sure most worried about that it was just it would be ruined by the studio and for sure like it could be you know i i hear that the the director's cut for example is is better 
And yeah, the thing I was most looking forward to was a feminist horror movie. And yeah, um, this is another of my, you know, I already mentioned, I really, oh, right, I yeah, I mentioned I, I watched, I suppose I didn't mention, I absolutely loved Barbarian and Fresh. Overall, I, I, I came close to loving Antlers, which also does have some feminism to it. Ah, uh, let's see. You know, the the core of it is a a young woman who is driven by her empathy. To you know, that's yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Not okay isn't really a horror movie, but it is like it's basically a feminist black comedy. And yeah, I I I feel like there's a lot of really great feminist content movies and and shows being made right now. So yeah. Like, uh, the, the, um, the, um, when I was younger, uh, feminism would very frequently be misrepresented. Uh, you know, for, for one thing, uh, like, very frequently movies and TV shows would show rape as something that women lie about having happened. Like, I, I think I, yeah, there was a while where I couldn't help but notice almost every single time that rape got brought up in a show or the movies that were coming out at the time, it would be a false accusation, and they would, like, that's extremely rare, but media, unfortunately, really informs how we view things, so for a lot of people, you know, they just go off, well, I've seen it in movies and TV shows, you know, they don't even necessarily think that, they just... Yeah, anyway, um, I'm glad that things are changing for the better. The trailers give too much away, and you should definitely not watch them. Uh, I don't know, I guess unless you want wank material. I, I'm, there's not really much there other than that, and they completely misrepresent the movie. They make it look like, you know... Uh, some, some, one, one of the... One of the yeah, it, it focuses on Megan Fox. There's actually one trailer that doesn't even have Amanda Seyfried, even though she is... I mean, I, th I think an argument could be made that she is basically the lead. It, you know, her and or Jennifer, possibly co-leads. Now, the cover and poster don't give too much away, but the, again, you know... It's, whether whether you like them doesn't you know if you, yeah if you like the the covers and posters just know that's not at all what the movie is like and it's not it's it's weird because there are a number of you know I've actually seen some some people make like fan posters and such because this is not a there's a lot of striking images in this movie that you could easily make into the actually I haven't watched the commentary track because it's not on Disney Plus but apparently at least one of the home releases featured and some someone noted that on more than one occasion while doing the commentary track you can hear the the palpable frustration and they you know they'll say why wasn't that the cover you know, wh why wasn't that the poster? So something like that. And, yeah. Um, on Rotten Tomatoes... Oh, right, right. Uh, here on YouTube, I found five clips. Let's see. A trailer, ten minutes of TV spots, including fan ones. Five music videos, including fan ones. Twenty-one review analysis, four documentaries, sixteen reactions. And... Yeah, a lot of shorts here on t here on YouTube. Some of them originally TikToks. And let's see the yeah. So so the on Rotten Tomatoes it has forty six percent and a thirty five percent audience score based on yeah two hundred more than a quarter million audience ratings and of the two hundred twelve critic. Reviews, 115 of them are rotten. And yeah, uh, oh, right, and the average audience rating is 2.8 out of 5. Anything above 3.5 counts as an upvote. 
so yeah, it is rotten for both, and let's see, yeah, and, and the consensus claims that it ultimately fails to be consistently funny or scary enough to satisfy, so just, yeah, again, I, I have to wonder how many of the people who felt that way basically made up their mind before watching and then just, yeah. Now, on Metacritic, it has a, hold on, oh, 47, based on 29 critics, and that's right, yeah, the user score is 7.3, so that's actually one of the, one of the places where it has a fairly positive here on uh, yeah, so, 9 positive, 14 mixed, and 6 negative reviews by critics, whereas the, uh, the, the user, uh, yeah, the, so, so yeah, 7.3 out of 10, 379 ratings, 253 of them positive, 59 mixed, 67 negative, and, right, let's see, is there something about, yeah, yeah, so I can, see the score, um, some people did actually like it back in, in 2009, but, but yeah, a lot of the ratings and, and some of the negative ones are very recent. There's one that's just over a year old and he gave it a zero, so. And yeah, um. And on IMDb, that's right, there's only 439 reviews and 306 without spoilers. I read the top voted 100, including spoiler ones. And yeah, uh, of those 100, five of them gave it a 1 out of 10, 2 gave it a 2, 3 gave it a 3, 4 gave it a 4, 6 gave it a 5, 17 gave it a 6, 21 gave it a 7, 20 gave it a 8, 11 gave it a 9, and 11 gave it a 10. So... Yeah, um, that, yes, for those who've been playing the playing the home game, that means that more people liked it than did not. Of the most upvoted IMDb reviews, in other words, when people go onto IMDb and actually read someone's review, the ones most likely to be voted up, the most popular by user vote, are the ones that give the movie a high rating. So that is, you know, I really appreciate it. It's, it's good we have something like IMDb because if you just look at, if you only look at Rotten Tomatoes, you might think this was a bad movie and a significant chunk of that, like 250,000, like, yeah, a, a chunk of those. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, Rotten Tomatoes allows me to, to see the number, but a chunk of those are from before Me Too. And, yeah, if, you know, if you don't agree with Me Too, you're probably not going to like this movie. And before Me Too, it wasn't really mainstream to have a lot of empathy for, for women, sadly. Now... There are 318 external review links in the IMDb external reviews section, and 143 of them still work and are in English. Now, let's see. So, a yeah, yeah. Um, the actual user rating, though, is only 5.4 out of 10 on IMDb. So, 136,986 users voted and... Let's see, so yeah, 20.2% gave it 6, 19.7 gave it 5. That is more reasonable. Like, I, I worry that it would have, like, a huge amount of 1s. I can understand giving it a, a 5 or a 6. I'll, I'll get to my rating very, very shortly, but that is... I, I had forgotten that that is actually... I don't know, maybe it's just because I've... You know, Willow got really ridiculous downloaded. Outright review bombed, even though it's actually a pretty good show. It's not the best thing ever, but it's a lot better than it's getting credit for, For if you just look at votes. 14.6 gave it 7, 12.2 gave it 4, 
7% gave it 3. That does seem kind of high for me. 6.2 gave it 10. 7.7 7 gave it 8. 5.0 gave it 1. That is still pretty high. Yeah. Um, if, if you gave it a really low rating and you, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, like get angry at you if if you want to try to maybe just write what what was it that you thought was so bad that it deserved such a low like i i i'm not sure i really understand giving lower than five honestly now uh yeah 4.2 gave it two and 3.1 gave it nine so yeah and Right, so awards, um, yeah, it won three, it was nominated for four that it didn't win, uh, let's see, right, the, so, so yeah, on, um, yeah, the MTV Movie Award, Amanda Seyfried won for best scared as shit performance, and it's true. She she does really really well at, at that. It's not the only time she does good acting in this, but yeah. And they it was nominated for best WTF moment, but did not win. It was nominated for Megan Fox for for a Razzie for worst actress. Yeah, I, um, others have, have discussed the Razzies at greater length than I intend to. I just, I, yeah, I just, I can't help but, anyway. Uh, let's see, um, right, Teen Choice Awards for, yeah, yeah, Megan won for, uh, Choice Movie Actress for Horror Thriller, and, yeah, that makes a ton of sense to me. And she was, uh, hold on, oh right, and Adam Brody was uh, nominated but did not win. And I can also understand, he's, he's a, yeah, the movie is better for having him in it, for sure. But it also, Megan Fox won a yoga award for worst foreign actress. I still don't, foreign are are they like saying that she doesn't speak English? Well, she's American, so what? Yeah, and it's and it's for American movies. It's you know this was American. Movie. Yeah, whatever. Now, uh, effects. I will grant there are some kind of meh CG effects, but they went practical whenever it wasn't impractical to do so, and they have some really solid. Just yeah, uh, some some of the uh, effect stuff. I suppose maybe not as much the stuff you see, but no, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm not gonna discuss it without in the in the before the spoiler section. But there's some really really great uh, practical effects in this that are just yeesh. There's some excellent stunt work as well, and yeah. Um, the, the horror elements are reminiscent of a young Sam Raimi or John Carpenter. Great directors to emulate. Who have also emulated horror directors they grew up on, such as Hitchcock. So there's no shame in emulating them. Right, and, and something I, I really appreciate. Um, on at least one occasion in this movie, it uh, depicts teen sexual experience. And it's awkward and unsexy like in real life. And that was actually... I remember... Uh, I'm not going to get into a whole thing on CinemaSins here. But yeah, the, he, he thought it was bad that the movie had awkward... Like, I agree that it's not fun to watch, but that's kind of the point. Like, do you not remember? Like, it's not... And it's it's honestly kind of weird, all the movies that make it seem like, oh, it's just amazing, you know. I Yeah, I already mentioned, you know... American Pie has some stuff like that, and it's it's just kind of weird, like, adults making these movies, yeah, anyway, um, so, I think that pretty much, 
Yeah, so uh, in the description box, there will be a number of links. D don't feel obligated to, to check out all of them. I do recommend all of them, but, you know, if, if not all of them are... Yeah, that's that's perfectly okay. Yeah, that's right. I did put... Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and... Yeah, I, do, I don't know why I... I put links to three videos that are in a series. I'm just going to... I've removed them now. It's just going to be the link to part one. Because in part one, you can get the link to parts two and three. So it doesn't look quite so overwhelming. Now, uh, on Disney+, Plus, this has no special features, but the... Uh, yeah, you know, the movie itself... Is there and other than Disney Plus, uh, it's on Google Play, Via Play, and right here on YouTube to rent, and I think you can also buy. So yeah, I think where I land. See, this is part of why I put the rating at the end, mulling over the the full. Yes, I I give this eight. Feminist horror movies out of 10. If we are talking like personal enjoyment, it's a 9 bordering on a 10. And honestly, I I wouldn't rule out watching this movie again later today. Like, I had so much fun on this. And yeah, uh, this is absolutely a movie that holds up. Like, if you watch it today and you don't really know very much about it, just be aware that there's some, like, kind of harsh 2000s teen movie stuff in there. But yeah. And uh, yeah, it's definitely a movie that deserved better than the initial reception. And I'm really glad that it's gotten this uh, reappraisal. I feel like... I think it would be good for something like the, um, ah, what's it called? Something like Rotten Tomatoes to maybe have more than one rating, kind of, because, you know, as it is, like, every, ah, hold on. I get, maybe, yeah, no, not, not all of them, but, but the, a lot of the, a number of the reviews that led to it being rotten are from 2009. And considering that it's gotten this reappraisal, you know, if, if you just... If nobody told you that it got a reappraisal and you just looked at... Like, let's say you're just scrolling through different options of, of like, horror or com and or comedy. And you check Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, it's really low rated. Like... There was a while where I've I've actually gone back and forth on whether or not I was going to do this. Um, I I it's rare for me to do a movie that isn't connected to a franchise that I also that I already cover and has such a low uh, rating on Rotten Tomatoes and certainly the critic rating on Metacritic is 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 you know also harsh. I, th I think it was forty seven out of hundred. So. You know, um, and and the fact that Metacritic users like it, like there are some really bad movies that they like. So yeah, but yeah, uh, that is it for the review itself. So if you have not yet watched the movie, just be aware the rest of this video is going to have spoilers. And actually, I'm, I'm not going to... Not everything I say will even make sense if you haven't watched it, so, yeah. But, you know, if you still want to watch, that's perfectly fine with by me. And let's see. That brings... Right, so yeah, notes taken while... Yeah, let me just... Notes taken while watching. So. I really appreciate, you know, like I mentioned in the in the review, I didn't want to give this away. But I love, like, we open in a stalker POV. And then it's revealed 
to be the hero stalking the monster rather than the other way around, that's great. Like, that's such a... Because, you know, we don't know it's needy from right away. And the camera slowly creeps up on this... Ah, uh, what's it called? The, um, the house that, that Jennifer lives in. And then we see this young teenage girl and it's like... What's gonna happen to her? And then, you know, turns out she's actually the the evil one. That is, yeah, that's a really, really great. And let's see. Yeah, and I like, you know, we... I, I quite appreciate that ne Needy wears these bunny slippers, like, I think completely consistently in all of her scenes in the the mental health facility. Like... Even when she's leaving, she's still, you know, something around these adorable little slip. Just, yeah. And, yeah, you know, she lifts her shirt, but it's not for titillation. It's showing the scars, which both, like, it raises the mystery what, you know, what happened there. And there's also the, the you know, it's, it's key to how her character has changed. And very... Shortly after she even starts speaking, not right after we've seen her, but as pretty much as soon as she starts speaking, does Jennifer check the mirror to see, you know, is, you know, does she look good right now? Yeah, and, and let's see, did I, am I remembering it right? Like, the mirror was inside her locker, and it's like, you know, of all the things that she thinks she needs, she, she definitely wants to to check her appearance every so often, you know. Right, uh, I just realized I haven't... I have empathy for her, and I do think the film has some empathy for her. I will talk more about that element in the next spoiler section. I realize I haven't really said... I've said positive things about Megan Fox, but I haven't really said very much positive about her character. I... I really like Chip and... Needy uh, together, like, don't get me wrong. I I think it would have been great if the, you know, not not for the whole cis hat thing, but just they're they're really cute together. Like, you know, he like she says, oh, the, the lead singer's extra salty, and he's like, what is this, salty? And she, you know, and yeah, she explains, salty. It's like really pretty. And then he says, well, then you're soy sauce, babe. And it's just, wow. That is that is just absolutely adorable. Let's see. And, you know, he makes some really great points about their relationship. And, you know, he points out the the place they're going to is not a club, you know, and, and needy takes over, you know, in narration. I, I quite appreciate, you know, her, the, the character has become wiser and now she realizes but when she you know when chip says that she claims that he's wrong about it you know so it is this thing of and and it's, you know don't get me wrong i'm not saying oh it's good that she finally started to listen to a man no it's you know when she is no longer being gaslit gaslighted by jennifer then she is ready to accept uh, truths are like that let's see yeah i i you know i really laughed when when you know chip is like stop kidnapping my girlfriend <laughs> part of it is just the delivery like it's just this kind of mm, stop stop kidnapping that's not nice and Roman's introduction, he's actually trying to assert power over Jennifer, and she fights back. And he, like, he's not quite comfortable. Like, you can you can tell from his face, like, he doesn't like that she fights back there. Like, I'll grant, it was playful, you know, the, what he says. He's not actually going to arrest her. He's joking, but he doesn't like that she pushes back against it. Like, he likes feeling like a man, like masculine tough you know because because yeah you know she's standing there like let's see 
I think, was it maybe about cigarettes? I think it was, you know, he's like, uh, you shouldn't put that poison in your body. I could, I could take you in for that, uh, you know, kind of thing. And yeah. Let's see. And I, I think uh, Adam Brody f strikes a really great balance between being funny and creepy. Like when he does the sh shoulder shrug, looking at needy like holy crap like just yeah this by the way this is a movie um if you're looking for a new sleep paralysis demon there's there's several in this you know um yeah uh, adam brody is responsible for a couple of them jennifer with the with the smile with the blood that's one um yeah just the the dreams are legitimately like you know they they um, what's it called? The 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 screaming and the fire legitimately scary. Like as they scream in pain and scream for help and such. Like I have no idea how anyone watched the scene and was like, was it supposed to be funny? Just or or didn't have a reaction to it at all. Like it's it's freaking horrifying. And I really like that, you know, when, you know, she calls her boyfriend because she, after, after getting home, Needy does. And, you know, when she says there was a fire, like immediately he's like, you're okay, right? Like just, there's, there's no, like, the, the, you know, he was hoping that they would, you know, spend some time together and then last minute she decides to go with with jennifer instead and then he call then, then she calls waking him up you know which is also like poor thing he if he's not spending the evening with needy he goes he just goes to bed like you know he doesn't really i don't know i guess it doesn't necessarily mean that he has no friends or something it just means he didn't really want to yeah and he didn't want to be in he didn't um he didn't want to be an imposition genuine now let's see and and you know he he asks if she wants him to come over which is all you know and see. yeah and and jennifer asks needy if she's scared she later expresses that she needs her victims to to be scared and right i uh, apparently in the actual in the the um the mythological succubus feasts not on human flesh so much as human testicles and apparently like that was a step too far for the censors so that's why she's eating human beings or eating boys instead of the the yeah and like it's again like so the part where like Jennifer like rips open Colin and she's then seen like dipping her hand like like she's drink drinking spring water or uh, not spring yeah whatever like you know cu cupping and like this nasty just ugh. that's okay but testicles that's a step too far and. Yeah, we, we get a flashback to the, the sandbox love, and we see that Jennifer is all... What was the thing? Like, she has... Yeah, Jennifer wants to pretend to be the pretty doll, and Needy has to play as the, the other one. You know, they Jennifer already felt that she had to be pretty for the world, and that Needy couldn't overshadow her. I really appreciate that this movie, before we see women crying the, the, because of the fire, we actually see the, the football player. I, I think his, was his name Jason, maybe? And Jonah, Jonas. Yeah. In my defense, they have the exact same letters, just not in the same order. You know, he's this big macho football player, you know, and he's actually, when, when, um, you know, every time that Jennifer says something that reminds him 
of of death and mortality, he's less into her when like you know, there's a lot of horror movies where the the expectation is basically well, you know, teen boys are always horny, so there's no but yeah, and he actually like when she just walks up to him, he doesn't react like, "Oh wow, the hottest cheerleader just walked up to me." You know, he's like, hey, you know, and it's not like he doesn't, you know, he he addresses her by name, "Hi Jennifer." So it's not like he's just completely he's never seen her before or doesn't know. No, it's you know, but he's grieving, so he's not, you know, and she does ultimately lure him away, but yeah. Poor Chip, he's jello of Colin. The you know why do you like Colin Gray? Oh, you know he's, we we have a creative writing class together, and he's he's very creative. He's he's you know kind of poetic with these. Uh, well, uh, I'm I'm creative too. Uh, I just uh, keep it on the inside, you know. Just <laughs> and she smiles at him because it's like you know, Chip, she likes you. Don't worry, she's not gonna leave you for Colin. But yeah, you know. I've I've said it before. The n there's no substance in the known universe quite as frail as the male ego. I speak from experience. Let's see. And I like that when um ah uh, let's see. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, needy keeps being confronted with the popularity of low shoulder, and like. I mean, yeah, I mean, for the first chunk of the movie, she doesn't even actually know what they did to Jennifer. She just doesn't like them being... And, and you know, yeah, it is like, you know, oh, uh, they're going to donate 3%, 3%, 3% of what they make is going to go to this, like, it's just, it's ridiculous. But And, and it really underlines, like... They got what they wanted. They're they're popular. They're they're a big hit all around America. I, I forget. Was it the world? They they say something about the the. Um, J K Simmons says something about their tour. I forget if it was national or international, and yeah, just you know, needy gets really frustrated with it, and it's funny, but it's also like thematically, like the the you know. As people are dying brutally, low shoulders doing better and better, and Jennifer is doing better and better. So that yeah, and yeah, Needy's mom is is worried about her, and she's asleep during the day because she worked all night. You know, it was that thing of because yeah, Needy was alone. She was she was home alone, and then the the. You know, Chip is like, where is your mom? And she said, well, what was it? Swing shift or something like that. I like the... Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the neutral and natural, not negative, depiction of sexuality, of teen sexuality. And, yeah, we see that one month is too long for Jennifer to go without eating anyone. And, you know, Colin does ask, you know, do you even know my last name of, of Jennifer? And it actually, yeah, you know, that's the kind of thing, because, uh, you know, a lot of guys don't care about the basic details of of a woman that they want to have sex with. So it is, you know, it is the kind of thing you might hear a woman say about, but it's not, it doesn't make him look feminine, which for 2009 would, you know, a, a man being feminine would have been seen as a negative. There's still a long, long way to go, but today there is some more. Yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, the um, the the infamous kiss in in the movie happens not long after experiences of both sex and death, and you know I I agree that there are some issues with the the kiss. I'll talk more about in the in the next section. 
but I do think it is noteworthy, you know, there's, like, um, Needy and Chip, you know, briefly had sex. You know, obviously it wasn't, she, you know, she didn't reach climax, and Jennifer has just killed someone and eaten of them, and, th you know, that's the, that's the situation in, that, that then leads to that, and... Yeah, you know, uh, sex is life affirming, and the the um, and and so is intimacy, uh, which you know the kiss. It's it's definitely intimate. You know, different people. Not not everybody agrees on whether or not it is inherently sexual. Now, so so yeah, basically, the viewers and me are told about the sacrifice happening about 40 minutes after it happens story-wise. You know, there's like about 20 minutes in is when Jennifer is driven away in the van, and then about an hour in is when we're told what happened that night. And yeah, so that was one of the most... That was a really messed up scene. I, I really, I, um, yeah, if you're someone who watched the entire sacrifice scene and was never, like, it never, it never got to you, it never felt disturbing to you, I hope we don't meet in person. But yeah, uh, you know, there's that thing about, you know, Nikolai says, tie it tie the ropes tightly i don't want to get clawed and um we're told by jennifer that she you know kept looking for an escape right uh i really appreciate I, I have more things to say about it but it'll be in the next section a lot of the time the teens in this movie are seen grieving rather than being like cliches and jerks to each other Yeah, there's not a huge amount of bullying. Like, Chastity is bullying um, Needy when she calls her... Yeah. When when she says that they're lesbian. And lesbians. And the... Yeah, Jennifer bullies a lot. But other than that, there's not a huge amount of bullying. Which, yeah, you know, like... If you look at teen movies in the 2000s, tons of, of bullying... And, and Needy points out that the grieving just didn't hit the same time after after Colin. You know, the everyone grieved the fire in Jonas, but, you know, gradually it didn't hit the same. I like the expectation subversion that, you know, it seems like, oh, the dance, that's going to be, you know, Jennifer's going to go there and she's going to attack. And Needy's gonna have to fight her, and then she never even goes to the dance, like... And... I really appreciate that Chip doesn't say hateful things to Needy when she breaks up. And, like, he doesn't really... You know, whenever Jennifer brings up Needy, he's like, that... I don't think she was cheating on me, and, and these kinds of things. And... Yeah, the the um, there's so many movies where if if a woman breaks up with a man, then the man is gonna say something really hateful to her. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen in real life, but putting it in so many movies just it's not helping. Right. Some some people d don't think that it makes sense for low shoulder to play at the ball. I'm not necessarily going to claim that it's, like, super credible realistically, but as the movie, like, the closer the movie gets to the end, I think we can agree. The more, like, the less realistic it is. Like, by the end, Needy is breaking the fourth wall, which I'll talk some more about in, yeah, very, very shortly, but... Yeah, you know, the reason that Low Shoulder play at the ball is to show how inescapable 
they are for for needy and underlining that you know their fame has risen as people die you know the the movie does explicitly connect the two even before the um sac even before we know about the sacrifice we're told that low shoulder were heroes during the the fire and these various you know they they're on the radio all the time you know she gets in the car to drive to to help chip and yeah the um yeah the radio comes on with low shoulder it's, yeah i appreciate that every time jennifer kills someone it's scarier than the last time like ahmed was off screen Jonas was a quick bite. Then with Colin, she's like riding him and bending over and biting into him. And then with with Chip, who she, you know, ultimately she does... Well, she doesn't feast on him. What she does to him kills him. One of the things she does to him is try to drown him. Like, that's horrifying. And it's also a great kind of, you know, when we see her holding him underwater, knowing that she's super strong as a succubus... And then, you know, Needy is on the way. Like, that's that's extremely tense. Because it is, like, if she just, like, snapped his neck and that was it, it was like, okay, I guess she's not going to be able to save him then. But because of the way they do it, you're like, oh, get there, get there in time, get there in time. It's even I, and I knew that he died, you know. I, I heard that before. I love the Jaws ref Like, I did not expect a Jaws reference in, in this movie. But yeah, you know, Jennifer, when she's under the water in the pool, like, you see the, the top of the water move, and she's just total Jaws reference. Love it. And when we go back to Jennifer in, the, in her room, we see that she's planning on who she's going to eat before Needy comes into her room. And she's also watching TV about exercise because she really... Yeah, and and essentially those two are the, the yeah yeah she's well she doesn't have to work off the the calories because she, when she eats people it doesn't make her but but anyway yeah you know she that's that's where her mind is always on her appearance and you know basically there's that expectation for her and. Yeah, now her appearance includes, you know, how to, how she makes sure she stays conventionally attractive. You know, she circles the the faces of boys in the was the yearbook, I think, and then like writes "yum" next, to... "yum" or "yummy," some something like that. You know, just yeah, that was, yeah, um, and that also tells us, you know, no needy really, because it's it's a tough sell. It's a tough sell to get the audience on board with a young woman killing another young woman in a movie, you know, because we are supposed to, but once Jennifer is dead, we are supposed to feel like th things are better, like it's, it's safer now. And yeah, you know, she, she didn't manage to kill, or, or she, yeah, Chip died, but she couldn't feast on him. So she goes home and thinks, well, who should I eat? Maybe she would go to the dance if Needy didn't uh, kill her. I care about every single death and all the trauma we see. None of it feels like white noise or exploitation to me. And, yeah, uh, at the very end, Needy is in complete control of the narrative. She breaks the fourth wall. Speak, you know, She looks at the camera as she's talking to the audience, not just, you know, before it was voiceover. And, you know, right, it's, it, it, right, yeah, yeah, she talks directly to the camera right before she escapes the asylum, and then, you know, the street sign, or road, road, whatever, I don't drive, I don't know what the words are for that, um, you know, it's for low shoulder, so, like, she, she, like, magically, supernaturally altered it via the, the demonic powers, apparently, you know, or it's just a, a break from... The reality of, of the movie but but yeah uh so so yeah i do have more things to say but they are in the next section so that brings us to the final section entitled notes taken before watching
and we are gonna dive into yeah so the sacrifice scene it appears like it might show jennifer get raped but instead since so many movies show rape in an exploitative manner it shows jennifer's fear growing as she verbally pleads to be let go the scene explicitly asks us to empathize with a woman who is about to be raped and a lot of misogynists could not handle that into that line. If, in fact, Megan Fox describes it as basically being metaphorical for how Hollywood and the press were sacrificing her body for their own purposes. You know, things focusing on her body got more attention than positive stories. And that might be part of why so many reviewers and so much of the press were so hostile towards the movie. They resented being called out. When that kind of thing ideally should spark soul searching. Like, I've in my life been called out and you know yeah some of the time it was unfair but some of the time you know usually when it was yeah other white men have called me out and like even years later when i think back it's like really that's where your values are that's what you think i should be called out for and then you know members of minority groups have called me out and i'll admit sometimes i've been ah what's the word uh, de defensive and and insecure about it but i've tried to go back over the things they said and yeah um you know i i'm hopefully better now for uh, having you know if you if you don't think i'm better because i'm more progressive than agree to disagree so uh, a couple of questions that people ask why do members of the band go from not being okay with the sacrifice to singing as they sacrifice her peer pressure who started the fire and how? Low shoulder to have an excuse to grab Jennifer for the sacrifice. That's why they don't look surprised when it happens and just immediately Nikolai's like, van, get let's get to the van. Why don't some research why don't researchers know that a bite from a demon gives you some of the power if you survive, based on the movie? Several reasons. For one, a lot of the time nobody survives being attacked by demons, underlining how capable needy is. Another is that a lot of people can't wrap their heads around the idea that strength can come from uh, let's see. Yeah, from being victimized. I realize today that concept is, by some, considered problematic, but for 2009, it wasn't just, uh, yet. Let's see. Yeah, and I mean, also, uh, is there maybe... Like, it's one thing for, like, when, when, the, um, when the occult researchers find, like, a bunch of dead bodies that have been, like, carved up and such... You know, they're like, okay, that's a cult. That's, uh, but if w the the um, yeah, you know, I uh, probably a lot of people in universe, yeah, a lot of people in universe don't th they they think that Needy is just a serial killer. They think she killed all of the the people. Maybe they even think she started the fire, rather than it it was always burning, and the yeah. The, the, um, I think a lot of people don't, in, in universe, don't think that she's survi a survivor of a demonic attack. They think that she's a serial killer, and that's probably how a lot of people end up looking. Because how do you prove that there was a demon? It, like, it's not like the, the, ah, uh, let's see. Like, the, the, let's see, if, if you, if you, um, yeah, yeah, I, as far as I understand, like, if, if you are forced to kill uh, a dog that is, um, uh, that has rabies, yeah, you can, you can do stuff to prove afterwards, no, no, it had rabies, I didn't just kill a dog. Let's see. Yeah, we see the, the, yeah, Jennifer vomits black goo, and, you know, in part it's to show that she can't eat regular food anymore, but it's also horrific to behold. And in this scene, she also stares silently at Needy. If you don't find that even remotely scary, just, I don't even know how to, that's just, yeah, the, you know, she stands there, first just completely neutral, and then slowly... You know, and, and the, yeah, you know, as she smiles, she, she shows, yes, the blood on her face is because she ate something raw. Like, it's not, you know, because, because, yeah, like, at first it's like, wait, did, uh, did she have to fight someone off, maybe? Or was, did, was someone killed very close to her and blood sprayed on? But then the smile shows that there's blood on her teeth and gums, which, yeah, that's not very common if you aren't, like... 
eating things raw. That's that's just that's not a thing. That's I'm, 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 if that's something you've ever experienced, I'm here to tell you you are eating things raw. Let's see. Yeah, and you know, as mentioned in the review, the horror elements are reminiscent of a young Sam Raimi or John Carpenter. Lots and lots of nasty goo vomited in Sam Raimi movies, frequently into the face of the young protagonists, so that fits as well. And the stalking really reminded me of Carpenter. Like, the opening could easily have, like, cut and reveal, you know, Michael? But, yeah, instead... The, let's see. Yeah, and in the end, the thing that allows needed to def allows needed to defeat Jennifer is that she rips off the BFF necklace, making Jennifer realize she really has lost her best friend. That's the thing, you know. That was also when she, you know, and and such a great because like usually, if a supernatural evil is about to attack you and then stops because of a piece of jewelry. Normally, it's a cross. And at the at the start of the movie, she specifically says, yeah, I mean, it's not crawling off the cross. I guess just, I... Yeah, she, she basically comes out and says she does not believe in, in Christianity, you know, which, considering where she was raised, she probably used to at least tacitly kind of, you know... Yeah, and, and instead... You know, Jennifer's about to to chomp on her neck, and the the jewelry is is highlighted by the camera and and editing and such, and it's the BFF necklace. You know, some part of Jennifer does not want to to hurt Needy. So the movie implies that Needy feels erotic love for Jennifer. Now, in two thousand nine, it was difficult to get films made by about LGBTQ relationships and feelings. So, sadly, by today's standards, it feels like. Q baiting it was not meant as that and let's see yeah so one of the scenes features Jennifer in a lake now the straight male viewer a lot of straight male reviewers thought that this would be shot in male I need to read the rest of the sentence before I start reading it evidently yeah, the, the straight male viewer thought this would be shot in male gaze since, you know, oh, it's the head cheerleader skinner, skinny dipping, but instead it focuses on that Jennifer is owning her new life, reborn. I can't help but think, you know, in her naked form she moves through water, puts clothes on, like moving down the birth canal maybe, because she is a different person, and, and I acknowledge that chronologically has she has killed before but it's the first time we the audience see her kill so i feel a little uncomfortable getting into the following but when this movie came out megan fox had not been naked on camera i don't think she has since either so when this came out a lot of people thought this is when it happens and they spent the whole movie just waiting to see her naked as the cast writer and director spent the whole movie trying to get these viewers to see her humanity so the reason that Needy ends up in an institution is because she is caught killing Jennifer by Jennifer's mother to whom of, it of course looks like the murder of a person rather than the killing of a succubus. Now, that's already like really darkly comedically funny. I don't know if I can make that any funnier, but I'm going to go ahead and try. So, you know, hypothetically, let's say that Needy could have managed to, to get some, some words out before... You know, this, this is what I think she could maybe have tried to say to, to Jennifer's mom. Hi, Mrs. Check. Jill, is it Jill? I feel like I remember your name is Jill, but you're shaking your head no, but that might be because you just caught me carving up your only daughter. There's a really great explanation for this. Do you know the band Low Shoulder? You probably heard Jennifer talk about them, but I guess that's probably not going to happen again. Through the trees, I will find you. No, nothing. Maybe I should start over. I'm sorry, could you get me like a paper towel, something? I'm starting to feel kind of self-conscious here in front of you, covered in your daughter's blood. So, when the indie band sacrifices Jennifer, their evil actions unleash a greater evil. It is in no way Jennifer's fault that she's sacrificed. After all, the band would have simply found another supposed virgin, or that she becomes a succubus. The movie makes it clear she has no say in the matter. Like, she doesn't even remember it. Like, Needy rationalizes, no, 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 they must have killed you. Otherwise, you know, they're... I, um, 
I forget what her reasoning is, but but she she believes that Jennifer was killed by the band when Jennifer is like, I don't know, I guess I got better, whatever. You know, they must not have killed me. It is simply down to the fact that she has been sexually active. Now, in real life, some women are hurt by the fact that they have been sexually active. For example, that they aren't the perfect victim. Rape allegations can lead to increased misogyny rather than increased empathy for women. This does not mean that the woman has done anything wrong. The evil action is still the rape. But some people feel that if a woman is sexually active, especially with, you know, a lot of people don't think that it can be rape if she has ever been... Uh, uh, if she has ever consented to sexual activity with that person, which is just absurd. It's not. It, it, it's not a lifetime pass. It's a. It's a case by case. Anyway, yeah, you know, a number of people feel that if a woman is sexually active, she's more likely to be, or, or looks like she is, she's more likely to be raped. Jennifer was corrupted by the actions of evil men, and this is a great metaphor for misogyny. It hits not only the people very directly affected, it hurts other men, men who have nothing to do with the sacrifice. At the end of the movie, Needy kills Jennifer the succubus and retains some of the power and uses it for justice slash revenge, since she herself was not corrupted. The band, her first victims, the corruption ended up hurting them. And, you know, throughout the movie, like, other, I'm not the first person to point out, the the guys she kills are not made out to be evil, and they easily could be. Like, if you knew nothing about Jonas other than, oh, like, I, th I think he's, like, the, the quarterback? Is that the thing? Quarter pounder. Yeah, she he goes from quarter back to quarter pounder for Jennifer, but you know the if if the only thing you knew was oh the in there's a horror there's a teen horror movie where the quarterback gets killed, you're probably assuming oh he's a jerk and we're gonna you know the the scene is done in a way that we think yes he deserved it, but no he's clearly made out you know he's he's sad because his friend is dead and you know yeah. So, like a rape or sexual assault in real life, the sacrifice of Jennifer changes her forever. In real life, not into a monster, but nonetheless, sometimes beyond recognition, a shell of their former self. It's noteworthy that despite the similarities to the rape revenge story, there is no actual revenge until the end of the movie. Some call this a flaw. In my opinion, if it didn't challenge the rape revenge story, then all we're going to continue to get is the same rape revenge story and it just is not as empowering as some people seem to think. It's much more interesting to have story stories now where the rape analog leads to monstrous actions instead of cathartic revenge as we watch the movie we may not enjoy seeing her killing men certainly they had nothing to do with the sacrifice i'm not saying anyone is wrong for enjoying that aspect though i i heard um a yeah someone apparently really liked that aspect that's that's fine you know yeah but but yeah um this is a movie that makes us empathize with the killer, whilst obviously not saying that it's right, in part because we see her before she started killing people. I'm, I'm referring to, to Needy, the, the end of the movie. Yeah. There are not that many prominent female horror villains, perhaps especially ones that are actually conventionally attractive. They tend to may, be made out to be repulsive, or at least plain like Mrs. Voorhees. I'll grant there are vampires that are conventionally attractive, rarely the the main villain like van helsing dracula is the main villain his brides conventionally attractive though they may be are not the main villain they're just their muscle the underworld films make the conventionally attractive vampire the female vampire the protagonist rather than the main villain i yeah and and when they do the the even the ones where there are maybe someone who's conventionally attractive, they'll often have them also take on a form where they're not conventionally attractive. I don't think I want to give examples because off the top of my head, I, I'm not sure I can think of one that is a... Um, where it's not kind of a spoiler. So there are not a lot of slashers where the killer and the final girl have a personal relationship, especially from the the first movie. Like, there are some that stay around for multiple movies. Note that I said not a lot. I didn't say none. 
so so yeah like i i love how this just challenges so many like i think a strong argument could be made that this is a slasher movie the um yeah and and it's or or a a um uh, um once removed cousin of a slasher movie basically it's it has the multiple deaths uh, it, it, you know yeah there's a there's a serial killer killing teenagers and the the yeah you know needy is a final girl it's just that we realize from the start that she's the protagonist and and that's also like there's a lot of final girls where it's just kind of well who's left i guess and just like if you there, there, are, there are a lot of slasher movies where you're not going to know who the the real lead is until everyone else is, is basically dead. And it's, until then, it's basically, like, almost ensemble. Like, everyone has some... You know, there, there's a lot of major characters. And, and then, after a while, there's only the one left. And that's not as interesting as making a horror movie that's... Like, this is... the, the I, I would argue... The, the lead here is Needy, and Jennifer is... I mean, she becomes the antagonist, but she is a secondary... She starts out as sort of a secondary protagonist, co-lead kind of thing. But, you know, there are parts of the movie that Jennifer... Like, her presence is maybe felt. And for sure, like, she does some things that really drive the narrative, but Needy is the... I, I would argue, and the movie makes it clear that it's about one or both of these girls from right away. The the it, this isn't one of the slash movies where it is basically just well, yeah, I guess it's gonna be one of these. There's there's only so many that it could be, but it's got to be one of those. Now, a lot of horror movies feature characters making really bad decisions so that the movie can happen. And in this movie, you know, the, the, this movie plays with that and it mixes in the stereotype that is frequently true that straight men will do anything to have sex with someone they're attracted to. In this movie, like, the, the um, Colin, Colin Gray, I do know his last name, keep, you know, he keeps going into the building even when he can clearly tell that the address that Jennifer gave him is absolutely not her real. Like, he waits until he's in there. It's like, this isn't your real house, is it? Like, you know what, Colin? I, honestly, I don't... How could you possibly miss that this is clearly just how she likes to decorate her house? What, is there some sort of crime against that? And I also love, like... The camera pans over the the what's it called the um the the lit candles. They really do a great job. Like there's a there's a there's a fine line between mood lighting, romantic candlelights, and I am going to sacrifice something living to something evil, and you have one hundred percent crossed that line. Jennifer, that is, that is not, like, and they do such a great, just, yeah, I, I really, they, they did such a great job on that. So, in this movie, men take on the roles of women, and women take on the roles of men, compared to the traditional slasher. The killer is female, although still born of a tragic event, and in this case, all of the victims of the killer are men. In a slasher, a lot of them will be women. It, it it's not a perfect one to one, but I do really appreciate that it it toys with these. And I actually, yeah, I remember seeing a um, one review where they were like, you know, the movie didn't do very well, so I guess maybe young men don't really want to be um, to be made the victims in in teen horror movies. I'm not entirely sure if that reviewer realizes just how bad that makes all us men sound like personally i you know a lot of my favorite horror is where men are in, in danger i already mentioned the the um that might have been in part one of this video because this is probably going to end up in two parts i already mentioned so yeah now i'm certainly mentioning i love the thing and that is a movie where men are at risk 
Perhaps the movie would have been better if Chip was a woman and or it was made clear that Needy was bisexual and had more sexual experiences than she appears to in the movie so that it would be a lesbian love triangle rather than the only confirmed bisexual sexually active trashy encoded as uh, actually, yeah. You know what? I'm not sure I really agree. I've seen others say that the the um, that Jennifer is kind of trashy and coded as dumb. I've I don't know. I feel like it's more ah crap. Yeah, I get okay. Yeah, in the present, I just I don't think it had to be that kind of way. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, she yeah. The the evil character here is the only one that like. It's possible that she's just toying with Needy, that she's not actually bisexual, but, you know, she initiates the, the kiss with, with Needy, and it is this thing of the, um, yeah, ah, uh, crap, what's the word? Mm. Yeah, you, you know, it, it's... Let's see, and right, yeah, I, I love that, you know, when Needy hears a weird noise, she investigates twice before the jump scare, toying with conventions, and technically, the person that shocks her is the film's killer, it's just that she isn't killed by the killer, you know, it's, it's such a great, because there's so many movies where you hear the weird noise, and it's also, like, she stays on the phone, so, like, hypothetically, if, like, she dropped the phone... Chip would probably come running, you know, he'd be like, okay, that doesn't sound right, you know, and, uh, and, and, yeah, and then she does hang up, she hangs up the phone after the, yeah, let's see, first it's the, 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 uh, her, her door is going ringy, and, you know, she, she's like, um, there's no one out here, this is very late in the day for Ding Dong Ditch, and then, like, some, some, like, apparently there's, yeah, yeah, then she goes to investigate, like, the, the stairs down to the basement, and it's like, she's gonna go into the basement, and she's gonna, oh, no, never mind, she just closes the door again, and, you know, and then the killer shows up, just, yeah. And, let's see, yeah, so the movie does not have an opening kill, even though so many slashers do. The first on-screen kill is Jonas, and that's, like around the middle yeah let's see i wrote around the middle oh no yeah never mind yeah that was no the the that's our basically 35 minutes in yeah 30 something like that and let's see yeah and then we get some flashback kills and present day ones now when jennifer kills Colin, it looks like she's riding him sexually. A lot of men think that sex position is inherently evil, connecting it to Lilith. So, yeah, um, love seeing Lance Henriksen in a cameo. You know, he is very well known for horror roles, you know, Aliens, The Terminator. And, yeah, you know, she, like he says, oh, they must be one hell of a band that you're following them this far. And she's like, tonight is their last show, you know. D -d -d Trust me, they are not going to be performing after tonight because I am going to fucking kill them. Something I find very cathartic is to laugh at misogynists, especially when they contradict themselves. This movie didn't do well despite the fact that a lot of things that misogynists claim to be true is explored here. This is a movie where the conventionally attractive woman betrays those closest to her is for sure evil, I'm talking about when she, once she is a succubus, and uses her sex appeal to take advantage of straight men, most of them white. Also, the indie band that speaks to women mainly is made up of evil people who don't actually care about their fans, only profits. But because the movie is told from a woman's perspective, that of needy, they don't like it. It's not enough to feature these ideas, you have to spew them uncritically rather than explore them intelligently, and men have to be in control. So, right, uh, some people question why is Jennifer still friends with, you know, Needy, who's not conventionally attractive, because Jennifer is the needy one. She wants Needy around to abuse to make her feel better about herself. That's part of the point of the movie. 
some people have said, oh, if a band is going to sacrifice people to the devil, they sh you know, if they're going to be Satanists, they should be a metal band, not indie. It being an indie band is way less expected. If you go into this movie not knowing what it's going to be, you're going to be taken by surprise that the indie band would sacrifice someone to Satan. If it was a metal band, you'd guess it before it happened. Like, if you go into a movie and there's a metal band and there's some kind of supernatural thing going on, and there's something kind of creepy about the band. Of course they're Satanists. Of course they're sacrifices, you know. Now, so yeah, the title has multiple meanings. One of them is to reference the whole song, which apparently some people are like flipped out that the movie didn't actually feature the because yeah, in case you don't know, there is a band by uh, there's a band called The Hole. They made a song called Jennifer's Body and yeah, it doesn't appear in it, but they do have a different song from the band Hole to underline, yes, it's a reference, you know. Can we please admit that it would be ridiculously cheesy if this movie featured a song that literally sung the title? Because, you know, the pieces of Jennifer's body, the pieces of Jennifer's body. So it would literally be like, just, yeah. Now, some other meanings. A lot of people can't see past Jennifer's body. A lot of guys want her. A lot of girls are jealous of her, despite how mean she is. The Satanists prefer Jennifer's body to be dead rather than living. A lot of guys don't care if they have consent to her body. They just desire her body. We hear that Roman took her back to her virginity, even though it hurt. Now, I realize that at the time this movie came out, a number of people still believe the harmful myth that losing your virginity is supposed to hurt, but still... I think they may have hoped this would help counter that. Now, some people say that the fact that Jennifer doesn't really change that much from the demonic possession means that the possession is basically pointless. I completely disagree. The fact that Jennifer goes from being high school evil to plain evil means that Needy is forced to reckon with Jennifer's evil. It is no longer acceptable to stand by because she is now killing people. She's killing the people that she thought of as disposable before she started killing people. You know, basically the whole high school thing of popularity has driven her to be evil there's an expectation that because she is so conventionally attractive that she must be mean to everyone else i think jennifer could have remained not sexually pure in this film like in real life it has no ethical value only the value we place on it but pure isn't good of heart she wasn't evil when she and needy first became friends the, you know like i mentioned they they um she was already focused on appearances but we don't, certainly we don't see anything outright, like, mean there. It's just, you know, Needy is like, do I really have to play the ugly one? Can't I be the, the pretty doll? But, you know, she's only bullying people when we see her in the present day. And, and uh, you know, flashback, but not sandbox flashback. Let's see. Yeah, she became evil as she developed her looks and realized people wouldn't think so highly of her if she wasn't mean. The movie is in part criticizing high school culture. Like, note that when she tells, when she's trying to convince Chip, you know, Jennifer, when she says Jennifer's evil, he's like, I know. Like, it does, it, it, without missing a beat. And it's not like he's never confused by the things that uh, Needy and Jennifer do and say. But, yeah, he's like, yeah, of course she's evil. Everybody knows she's evil. You know, she's allowed to be because she's conventionally attractive. There's an expectation. You know, the, the, there are actually, there are people who are conventionally attractive, but are are more like, um, what's the word? They, they don't, yeah, if, if they are like, if, if, if they'll if they'll chat up someone who's not thought of as particularly impressive, then a lot of people will think of that woman as less desirable, less powerful. So after the demonic possession of Jennifer, she seems to not care about anyone's trauma. She very matter of factly recounts what happened to her. She seems bored, even annoyed, by other people upset about the fire, later the killings. The satanic band treated her with no empathy for the trauma they inflicted, so now she feels no empathy for trauma, period, that of others, or even her own, before she became possessed. And after she becomes possessed, we see that Jennifer doesn't care about anything other than her own appearance. And, you know, 
Maybe she never did. When she's just eaten, she gloats to Needy about how good she looks and feels. Like, you know, she calls her just to gloat and just to be, you know, she's like, I don't want you to talk to someone else. I want to gloat about how good I feel, about how good I look, you know. And when it's been a while, she talks about how bad she feels about her appearance. You know, she even says, it's like I'm one of the normal girls. She has no empathy for the grieving of all the others in the wake of these of the tragedies the community is suffering while she gains from these losses. This is truly evil. I mean, for crying out loud, she's almost as bad as a large corporation. She does not kill anywhere near enough people to be as bad as a large corporation. And, uh, let's see. You know, their, their death toll is extremely high. Let's see, the, the, what was the thing that I want, oh, right, right, you know, she and the band benefit from the, the pain. Now, while both are about teen girls, Ginger Snaps 1 and 2 being better, to be fair, those are about, right, right, yes, so the, the yeah, I am, yeah, some people say that Ginger Snaps 1 and 2 are better, some people say it's only Ginger Snaps 1 that's better than this. To be fair, those movies are about puberty and sisters, not trauma and the complexity of female friends, friendships, uh, you know. I'll, I'll grant that, you know, from what I've heard, uh, Ginger Snaps is also about something really awful happening to teen girls, but it's not the, the, it's not coded as a, the, the, quite the, um, yeah, anyway. Um, let's, like, if, if this movie was just, was about puberty rather than traumatic assault, that's, uh, like, the way it's, it's handled, it's a lot like a sexual assault. You know, uh, for sure, like, you know, what they, they think they're killing someone, and they could, the movie could have filmed it, that's maybe also some, maybe people thought that there should be blood in that scene when it's actually much more... Like, if if you see the the knife go in and blood pouring out and these kinds of things, then it doesn't work as well as an allegory for rape, where, you know, that's, yeah. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, Needy is played by conventionally attractive Amanda Seyfried in glasses and with unflattering hair and the like. And at the end of the movie, she no longer wears glasses and she comes across as a lot more confident once she has some of the demonic power. I don't think the movie is just doing the Hollywood trope of even the less conventionally attractive, right, even the less appealing girl has to be conventionally attractive if we're supposed to empathize with her. Rather, I think they felt it was necessary to cast someone conventionally attractive in order to pull off this sort of twist on the character at the end that Needy becomes more confident, more appealing, because confidence is appealing. I think the end of the movie presents us with an alternative to Jennifer herself. Needy is not evil. Low shoulder deserve their deaths at her hand. But she is confident and powerful. The movie is saying not all confident and powerful conventionally attractive of women are evil and this is very important in a field and subgenre that tends to hate conventionally attractive women and women in general and a movie that does have a conventionally attractive woman who is evil i, th I think it's critical like i i completely agree that there are a lot of movies a lot of american movies made where you know they'll just they'll put glasses maybe some paint stains on their clothes and stuff like that in order to to you know slightly dressed down, the conventionally attractive, and, you know, obviously, like, if you're going to, uh, hold on, the, um, if you're gonna do, you know, like, um, the movie Welcome to the Dollhouse actually cast Heather Matarazzo, who, you know, at the time was not conventionally attractive, because she's playing someone who isn't conventionally attractive, usually American movies won't, you know, that's, it's an indie movie, that's why, it, you know, Todd Lons is not super interested in filling his movies with a bunch of conventionally attractive young women, and, like, yeah, anyway. So, um, let's see, I think that was the, yeah, you know, the, the if the movie didn't have needy, you know, conventionally attractive there at the end of the movie, some people might walk away from the movie thinking, oh, I guess 
convention conventionally attractive women are evil you know that's and there are a lot like a lot of slasher movies kind of don't really draw a line between like i'm sure some people fear freddy krueger because of the burns when really the thing that's you know the like if we're gonna put like obviously you know he's killing people that's that's the the evil but if we're gonna compare it to some like yeah, you know, some people are very uncomfortable around uh, burn victims because of the way their skin looks. You know, but Freddy Krueger, like, the thing that we're supposed to really hate about him before he started killing people is that he was a pedophile, you know. And and I've heard apparently some, like, okay, essentially, if you feel the desire to you know if you if you choose not to act on it you know the, the like um pursue therapy try to try to uh, yeah but people who act out their pedophilic desire you know that is evil they are victimizing someone and yeah you know i maybe it would have been good to have at least one of the you know it, yeah, it, it uh, the the um in the case of Freddy Krueger, like I I wouldn't rule out some people might walk away thinking oh I guess I'm supposed to be scared of people who've you know had have burned uh, what's it called yeah have, have some of their skin has been burned so uh, right some critic quotes. The movie is more complex than you might think. Jennifer is a bad person even at the start of the movie, and the men who she kills are not bad, and all of them are missed by their families. The movie is not saying you should go out and make sure you have sex as soon as possible, or that you, you should be a virgin until marriage. The traditional slasher movie route is for women to die as soon as they engage in premarital sex. Here is a slasher movie where one of the women who had premarital sex becomes a succubus because she's mistaken for a woman, for a virgin, and another woman who had premarital sex manages to stop her murderer's rampage. It's basically saying you are not lesser for having premarital sex, and doesn't automatically mean your life will be amazing if you have premarital sex. Jennifer is targeted because of her perceived virginity rather than being safe because of her perceived virginity. And she comes back to life after the attack because she had sex. The movie is a rape revenge without actual rape. The sacrifice stands in for the rape. The movie is in part about the complexity of female friendships, shows a toxic female friendships friendship. Jennifer is a bad friend long before the possession. She just isn't dangerous to, you know, she's not killing people before the possession. That was a that was what a, a woman got out of watching this. Now there was a man who watched this and took away Jennifer is a good person until she's possessed, and then she becomes the shallow evil sex pot, cruel and heartless that she was mistaken for because of her appearance. I don't want to say that we're bad at analyzing you know feminist media. I don't have a way to end that sentence. Again, I try to to do better, but yeah, I was bad at it for a while as well. So the band sacrificed Jennifer and her body to Satan for their own benefit, not caring about her pain and loss of life, even smiling and singing as they sacrifice her. So basically a Me Too metaphor made before Me Too. Megan Fox in this movie is made grotesque and monstrous rather than conventionally attractive. Let's see... I like that in this movie, like in Scream, we see people reacting to knowing that there's people dying. After making a movie when reflecting on realized... Uh, let's see. It, yeah, uh, Needy re represents who she was before she became Diablo Cody, and Jennifer represented Diablo Cody. Now... So the writer says it's not sexual attraction between Jennifer and E, just close to it. The movie doesn't make it clear if they're bi. They definitely aren't lesbians, but they could be straight. Like, before she becomes a succubus, Jennifer does have sex with boys and doesn't seem... Like, she, she calls them disposable, but she doesn't seem to think that sex with boys is just something she needs to do 
in order for people to not realize that she's actually lesbian or something. She does legitimately appear to, you know, other than back to her virginity with Roman, she does appear to want sex and enjoy sex. Now, one person said, nothing comes of the framing device. It could just start at the actual beginning. Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure... Yeah, I'm I uh if there is something that that really Well, no, wait. Yeah, yeah. Um the framing device is her taking control of the narrative. Uh in in my opinion, like I talked about in the yeah, in the first thoughts section. So, let's see. I thought this film was pretty good. The scariest scene I've seen in a mainstream movie so far this year has to be the scene where Mrs. Fox is staring at Miss Seyfried prior to returning from the sacrifice. The lighting and makeup are exactly right, but it's the look in Miss Fox's eyes that caught me completely off guard. The look in her eyes is at once sexy and surprisingly genuinely creepy. Actually, from that point on, I found myself looking at Miss Fox in a completely different way. Without having to consistently rely on scary makeup, I thought she was a convincing villain. I can't wait to see it again. And, yeah. Um, it really is, like... Yeah. Let's see, I, I personally think she plays every note completely perfectly. Uh, throughout this entire film. I want to mention two disturbing moments that I thought were highlights. One was the beginning where she kicked the orderly. At first I laughed because it was such a sudden and powerful kick and the way the orderly stumbled over somebody else and had a hard time getting up. But then when I saw the blood and horror on her face, it became upsetting. This poor lady just doing her job, getting the shit beat out of her for no reason. A similar scene was at the end when Jennifer's mom discovers Needy just after murdering her daughter. It's such a jarring switch from fantastical monster movie to family tragedy. Good job on that scene. In the 21st century, the girls have already beat the guys. Now they have the room to show the most dangerous thing of all, that the biggest threat to girls is other girls. The kiss is shot in male gaze. It feels like it's for straight men to get off on. I I hate to say, but I, I agree. Uh, I, for it to not, it would have to be something that straight men don't find sexually appealing. Like if there were two men kissing each other in male gaze. Or two women, but not gay, male gaze. But two women and male gaze. I'm thrilled that it worked for lesbian bi's and the rest of the LGB. You know. But it felt like it's for straight men and not exploration but J.O. material and yeah uh, I, I acknowledge that apparently uh, I forget if it was Kusama or Diablo Cody but one of them expressed that they felt that it was you know it was bisexual it was for the lesbian something like that they they didn't think of it as for straight men but you know if you yeah uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, some people said you know, the possession should have been explained 30 minutes in instead of an hour in. I can, I, I guess I can see what they mean, but I think the moment that Needy finds out that there is something supernatural going on, that's when, like, you know, Jennifer explains, no, 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 they stabbed me, but here I am, I heal everything now. You know, when I eat people, I look good and feel good. You know, so Needy is like, there's something wrong, that's, you know, and, you know, the, the uh, like, basically before that, Jennifer's gaslighting was keeping that, like, she was feeling like there's something wrong here, but Jennifer gaslights her, and so she does you know, sadly, that is very effective. Now, let's see, so the, the, um, um yes, once Needy knows about the possession, she, you know, pretty quickly figures out, because, because, yeah, you know, an hour in, we are told, we're shown the, the whole thing, and the movie, oh, there's only 36, let's see. So from, yeah, so the flashback part ends an hour and eight minutes in. There's less than 30 minutes left. So, yeah, right after that, she goes and 
does the research, breaks up with Chip, and then we have the, the ending chunk. So the, the um, what's it called? Basically, like, if the, if the audience knew, then we'd be impatiently waiting for Needy to catch up. And, yeah, I, I think it was the, I think it was the right choice. So, uh, yeah, uh, some people said that the movie doesn't go far enough. The male victims should be toxic, or it should be more male gazy. but as it is, it's, it's just not enough. I respectfully disagree. I think they hit the exact right balance with almost all of it. So... That's it. Um, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie that... Yeah, favorite feminist horror movie. And let's see. Uh, yeah, if if there was something... If, if the... Um, let's see. Yeah, if, if you as a feminist dislike something about the movie, you know, yeah, what... What do you dislike and how do you think they should have done better? So, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it's a demon that should be killed. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and... Let's see, uh, yeah, yeah, and one talking about the most recent episode of Willow, where I spoiled the episode. And recently, the Ruined Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want videos like this, you're not. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.